Hello and welcome back, everybody. Um, yeah, sorry about the technical difficulties that we all experienced in the last uh, two talks, especially uh, starting with Dr. Ayer's uh, talk. Um, just to let you all know, she had kindly agreed to re-record her talk, which will be added to the recorded um, um, version of the event. And so it will be all crystal clear for you to access once the videos are edited. Um, now, without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Traulach Brugge, Terry Brugge, who's a professor of psychiatry in the University of Leicester and consultant psychiatrist. Uh, professor Brugge was trained in psychiatry and epidemiology at the University College Dublin, Ireland, and at the Institute of Psychiatry and the MRC Social Psychiatry Unit, King's College London. His achievements include the development of the world's most widely used measure of, of stressful life events, the list of threatening experience, and the completion of the world's first national adult general population programs of surveys of the epidemiology of autism spectrum disorder in adulthood and old age. He leads a long-term program for clinical trials on the prevention of perinatal depression. Terry is also chair of the WHO Advisory Committee on the schedules for clinical assessment in new psychiatry. Without further ado, I hand over to Professor Ruga. Hello, and thank you very much for that introduction. Um, if I could just add my apologies, I've had great difficulties this morning, or today, I should say, connecting with you. And uh, but everything seems to be working now fine. I've had a complete failure of one of my laptops and the other one was not set up for this meeting. Um, can I just check with you guys that somebody would be able to run my PowerPoint for me? If you'd like to sort of start the first slide, please. Jason is going to do that for you, okay? That's great. Yeah, that's lovely. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so um, I mean, I've talked about the subject of the epidemiology of autism many times, and I've become more conscious in recent times of the fact that there's a lot of information out there, and uh, it really throws up a challenge for people to know what sources are trusted. So I decided to kind of build the talk around that theme as we were today. Um, I hope that makes it a little bit more interesting. Um, I'm assuming that by now everybody um, either watching this webinar uh, when it's recorded or live at the moment uh, knows what autism is. I'll certainly be talking a bit about the challenge of how you turn that into a, a survey program. So I can move on to the second slide, please. Okay. And, uh, yeah, I just actually just sort of hit the enter key, move on to just the rest of this slide. These are the really headings that I'm going to go through. Um, just go back, yeah, stay there, just hold on to that, that's lovely. Um, so I'm actually going to be asking you, and I know for those of you who kind of just watching the recording, this may seem a bit odd, but nevertheless, I would encourage you to use your phone, or whatever you've got, your laptop, to, to do some Google searching. Uh, I'll then be talking about, um, uh, this whole issue of how you find trusted sources and how you use, I'm assuming that all or most of you have clinical expertise within psychopathology, within psychiatry, and many of you within neurodevelopmental disorders. So I'm going to kind of latch my argument on to the huge value and importance of what you've got, because I think many other people working in this area are sorely lacking in those skills and how to use them and incorporate them into research. Um, an example of that in, in terms of a systematic approach, uh, just been mentioned in the introduction, is the SCAN interview, this systematic, uh, it was actually known as the Schedules for Clinical Assessment of Neuropsychiatry, but I'm toying with the idea that we might call it systematic clinical assessment in neuropsychiatry. Um, I'm going to mainly focus on autism, but I will touch a bit briefly on ADHD, which is the other kind of major common area of interest and importance in adulthood. 
But I won't be saying very much about the epidemiology there, although what I will be saying about methods and so on are equally applicable to that area. I won't be touching on intellectual disability, except just to mention it briefly, but the, the approaches are somewhat different and actually very well established in many respects. So we're talking about epidemiologic approaches to these kinds of, of tasks. Um, and of course, in epidemiology, although we, we are usually funded to count the prevalence of things, we're actually far less interested in that than we are in what's associated with conditions. And if you include genetic epidemiology as well as, as epidemiology, which doesn't have a, an epidemiological component to it, this is the branch of medicine where we actually determine what are the causes of things, uh, the external environmental causes, the life course developmental causes of things. And we've been able to do a little bit around that in adulthood, but actually very little because most of the funding and focus and tension has been on this, I always call it an obsession with prevalence. And indeed, I would be <laughs> obsessing on that very topic myself. That's where the, the attention has been. But for those of you, um, who are in clinical practice, and I'm assuming that most of you are, the real question is, and this is where prevalence is very important, is how common is it in my clinical population, in the people I'm asked to see, or I see for whatever reasons I'm asked to see them or need to see them. And that applies to everything in medicine. Hopefully all of you were taught this as undergraduates, and you would have been taught that you need to know how common a given condition is in the population that you see, because that will affect the decisions you make about further investigation is something that is extremely rare. You'll probably put that way down the list in terms of differential diagnosis, but if something's very common in population, you know you need to be alert to that, even though other people may not have been thinking about that when they saw the patient that you're seeing today. So on to the next uh, slide, please. Um, so just you know, the first bullet point there. Um, so it just, it's, it's quite frustrating these sessions because I can't really have a dialogue with you, but we'll do our best. So I want you to use whatever device you've got there and just tap, type into the search engine, epidemiology, autism, just those two words. I did this last week when I was uh, preparing this uh, talk. And I have to say that actually you had to trawl down through the list to find something that was actually really going to be helpful. But there were some encouraging things there. Um, there were actual pickups of, of good authoritative of papers. Um, there was some reference to a very well-known program of research, which I'm going to talk about a bit in a moment in the United States, um, but it wasn't particularly prominent. So it was, and I was using Google, the Google engine there, so that was quite good. But of course, what I get, and this is why I wish this was interactive, but we can't do it, is that every single one of you will get a different list on that search because of your use of Google. Uh, so the topics that I got were reasonably relevant to an epidemiologist interested in this area. But if you're not an epidemiologist, and if you're not working clinically in this area, you probably see some things coming up that are maybe from newspaper media or, or TV or other sources or movies, who knows, which are completely different from what I've seen. So I would actually recommend that you, uh, when you're doing searches, uh, particularly in an area that's new to you, that you consider using a search engine that doesn't actually incorporate all the information that you have given it in the past about what your interests are. And you try and go for a very sort of neutral, you will have to trawl through a lot through more hits, but you're more likely to get something which is not sort of biased towards what you, your, under, your interests are. Um, so moving on to the next bullet point, please. Um, and that's just for you to reflect on what's coming up. You can't tell me that, unfortunately. <clears throat> the question is, how are you going to know how to trust what you see as a, as a source of information? Um, I mean, as David Spiegelhalter is probably one of the most distinguished epidemiologists, uh, well, yeah, stat stat medical statisticians, I should say, in, in the country now, very famous during the time of the COVID uh, and got himself a knighthood for that, and well done. I had the privilege of, of meeting David uh, first when I moved to Leicester back in the late 1980s when he was on the staff with us, but he got pinched by Cambridge. It's not the first time that sort of things happened to us, but uh, he's very approachable and he's a very witty person. And he's very, I mean, one of the key points he makes is that 
you, you, you can't do a deep search for every question. You've got to kind of tailor that. Um, but if something's really important to your professional work, your clinical practice, you do really need to dig deeper and make sure that your sources are reliable. Um, and this is the stuff I think, this is just purely inside, but this is the stuff that our kids should be taught. I mean, my eldest grandchild is now nine, uh, has just spoken to us about Google and doesn't know anything about it. And this is the time at which she actually needs to learn that an awful lot of stuff that comes up is not trustworthy and to begin to learn. Because we all have these devices. We can find out anything we want. We don't need to know when, when Henry VIII was born or died because we can look it up. We do need to know whether the source that's provided the information is a, an authoritative document source, as it were. And that's a slightly trivial way of putting it, but it's a good illustration. Next bullet point, please. Um, and next one, please. Okay. So this, of course, is something that we were all taught called clinical appraisal, cl cl sorry, cl critical appraisal, um, when we were looking at uh, research articles and deciding whether they were robust enough. And again, we were looking at sources there. Um, and I think one, one does that in terms of, of, of journals and their ranking and whether they do have good systematic um, um, peer referee and peer review and so on um, and I think over time we learn again what the trusted sources are um, and we have to ask ourselves in each case uh, who might be biased and indeed nowadays we're supposed to declare conflicts of interest and I think conflicts of interest are something that for each of today's presenters have been asked to provide uh, and I've done that um, so the next um, well, that first question there, who is biased or motivated to claim that autism is on the rise? So I'll give you a couple of seconds to think about it. Who out there, what kind of organization would wish to claim that there's an epidemic of autism, that it's on the rise? Um, and therefore, can you trust such organizations? And I will give a, a, an illustrative example of, of the problem uh, in a moment, but just, just to think about that. Uh, next bullet point, please. Um, uh, and the next one, yep, yeah. okay, and the next one, yeah, okay, so this is um, a kind of headline from the New York Times, it's actually quite a few years ago now, and certainly long before the pandemic, um, and this was in the context, to some extent, of vaccine deniers and so on. And of course, most people nowadays do know one thing about autism, which is that there was um, an article in the Lancet, I think it was in the 1980s, the 1980s, 1990s though, um, which subsequently, after many years of objections from many people, was actually withdrawn by the editor of the Lancet. But I think it took them far too long to realize that there was false, falsified information in the article. And it raised this suggestion that there was a link between autism um, and vaccination, the MMR vaccination. And I've had a number of students in recent years actually looking into sort of mass media around this. And it's a story that hasn't gone away. And it actually forced responsible media organizations like the BBC to recognize that a balanced approach to reporting did not necessarily mean giving the opposers to something like MMR the same amount of airspace and airtime as those who are uh, in favour of vaccination. And uh, they're now much more sophisticated in the way they approach that. But there are plenty of sources of information that are not. Um, I was interviewed by a reporter in the New York Times around about the time we published our survey work. And I think they took a very considerable interest in the trouble that we're taking to try and do things reliably. So on to the next slide then. Um, yeah, so that's another kind of example of this, but that's an example of a, a good media outlet where there are, you know, it's a very wealthy organization. Their journalists are very well trained and point chosen and so on. They do go into things in depth. It doesn't mean they always get things right. Now this is, um, the answer to my question, in a sense, what kind of organization would want to persuade the world that the particular disease or condition that they're interested in is on the rise? And my answer to that, amongst others, it would be a charity that is um, 
supporting um, and taking interest in that particular disease group and indeed receives lots of charitable funds and so on to, to encourage and support the work they do. Um, now, the biggest autism charity in the world, as far as I know, um, but please check this if you have any doubts, is called Autism Speaks and across its United States base. So on to the next bullet point. Um, so this is, um, I'll just go on to the next bullet point. You just want to read through these yourselves. Yeah, okay. So, um, slightly complicated story here, but essentially, um, uh, and this is a few years old now, I haven't seen the latest statements they've made about the prevalence of autism, and they tend to make these statements about autism in childhood. They don't focus very much on adulthood. Although adult and, and old age represent most of the living population on the planet, certainly in developed and developing countries, they do. So if you want to know about the prevalence of autism, you, should, you can't, can't afford to leave out most of the population, but they, they do tend to focus on children. Uh, it's worth asking why they just do that. Um, and they were quoting there a new survey which had come out. Now, when I looked into this, it was actually a very respectable survey. It's a, a federal United States uh, survey, which is repeated every few years. And in the latest survey, and this was about three or four years ago, they included in the list of conditions that they ask about, you know, have you had any of the following conditions? They added autism onto it. And they come up with this figure of, I think it's one in 45 children age three through to 17, the, the, the parent, uh, the parents who were being interviewed in these surveys had indicated that their child had been, or it's been mentioned, or it's been mentioned, or they've been diagnosed, or they've been investigated for it. And then you see the other points they make there. They then refer to um, a very famous program of, of research being conducted uh, in the United States, which um, involves basically looking at health and education records on age, uh, children age eight in particular counties and particular states in the United States. So they cover about, I suppose, one tenth of the population of the whole of the United States. And the states in which this work has been done range from some of the very poorest low income Midwestern states to um, the very high income East Coast states. Um, and what that, and what they do basically is they, they have a, a reviewers who review the medical and education records and they determine from that whether that child is likely to be autistic or not. So there's no direct examination or assessment going on here. And they started doing this in about 2000, they report every two years and every time they report, with I think one exception, it was 2012, the prevalent, the, the, the rate of autism across all of the, the average across all of these states goes up a little bit. Um, now it's called the CDC surveillance series. So it's one of the surveillance series. So in epidemiological and public health policy, it's a surveillance program. It's not an epidemiological program. It's not designed to measure prevalence, but it's picked up by the media as being a prevalence survey. Um, and again, nobody questions that, except people like myself who are very awkward about these things. And indeed, occasionally CDC do actually, when they publish, say, an article around this, they do use the word prevalence. So they are guilty of a certain amount of slippage on this. Because all it is, is it's, it's a judgment of records. Um, and uh, we'll come in a moment to what I mean by sort of a correct way of doing epidemiology. But the, 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 the thing I found particularly perverse at the end was they actually quoted and named an epidemiologist, but they, they drew the, they decided that they preferred the 1 in 45 estimates rather than the CDC estimate, which is lower. It's around about, I think, 2% at the moment in the latest work. Um, and again, just to speak to their own um, mission, which is, you know, there's an epidemic of autism. Well, we have found in, in, in painstaking research, two programs of research in, in the UK, that there isn't an epidemic of autism. But autism is relatively common. and It's a very serious condition. So we shouldn't have to turn it into an epidemic to, to be interested in and concerned about it. So on to the next slide, please. And sadly, when Hillary Clinton was running for presidency, she actually, yes, on to the next slide, she actually uh, had in her, her, her kind of 
I forget what politicians call it, but whatever she was campaigning on, I suppose, her campaigning statement, that there would be a prevalence survey and they would do one like we've done in the United Kingdom. I thought I'm quite happy about that because that can only be the work that we've done ourselves uh, with the help of people who are, some of whom are teaching today, such as Tom Burney. Um, so that was good, but unfortunately the result of the election, uh, and I, I think that's interesting as well, because the the polls that were going on suggested that clearly Clinton was going to win that election, but in fact, she, she, as we all know, she didn't, and history was changed by that, and the United States has still not done any epidemiological work on autism and adulthood. On to the next survey slide, thank you. And that's the C that shows you the parts of the United States where the CD program is, is being carried out. Um, yeah, and the, 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 the results they're getting show that rates using the surveillance sense uh, are, are lowest in the, in the low income areas and highest in the high income areas in the United States. They're also much lower in non white populations and much higher in white populations. Um, so if you live in, in, in New York or the, the state immediately to the west of New York, uh, which is probably the highest income where all the billionaires live, um, the chances of, of a kid being picked up and having autism recognised and diagnosed and so on is much higher than it is anywhere else. So oh, just the next bullet point, please. Yeah, so those are slightly out of date now, but the, the, I say the estimates were going up every two years. And uh, that's some of the information I've already given you there. There's one other piece, just back to the previous slide. At the bottom there, there's a reference, Lundstrom et al, 2014. This is a BMJ article. So if you do want to look into this further, that's it's not on my reference list at the end of the talk, but that's a very nice study where um, neurodevelopmental screening questionnaires were being issued to, to parents of school children, eight-year-old school children. In, in the city of Gothenburg in Sweden and that sort of county surrounding that city. Every, every, every you know, once every year to the, the children in the eight-year-old classroom group. And they've also got um, very good sort of public health systems in, in Sweden. And so they have a, a good availability of child guidance service and diagnostic services for neurodevelopmental disorders in childhood. And basically what they showed in this paper is that the rates being reported, the number of diagnoses was increasing a little bit every year over the eight years. But the screening questionnaire, which is based on parental observation, which is a very well validated screening questionnaire, showed that the, that the, that the scores were exactly the same throughout each of the eight years. Um, so just moving on to the next bullet point. This is just a little bit about um, assessment in, in autism. Um, of those measures, the second one there, the autism diagnostic observation schedule, um, which is a direct observation measure. I don't know whether anybody else has sort of mentioned that and some of you will know about it and some of you indeed will have been trained in it. But for the purposes of an adult survey where you are basically approaching individuals and you're only gathering information from the person who's the respondent who selected randomly in a survey, the only thing you can really do in terms of current uh, developed instruments is to use the ADOS because it's partly an interview with the individual, but it's also a test of the way that person communicates, whether they use nonverbal communication and things like that, which are things that are abnormal in autism. Um, and after a, a review of various options and talking to various experts around the world about how to do this, uh, came to the conclusion the ADOS was really the only way we could do this. The other measures there, you've got the ADIR, um, uh, which is a developmental instrument. We did use that in a small subset of our survey as a validation too, and it was very helpful. Um, the third bullet point there, the RC Psych interview guide for the diagnostic assessment of able adults with autism um, is available on the college website. Uh, I think you have to be a member or fellow or affiliate of the college to be able to access that. If you haven't discovered it, it is a wonderful tool if you suspect that one of your patients is autistic, they haven't had an assessment. It's quite short to do. Tom Burney may have mentioned it uh, already today or maybe mentioning it later on today because he was very much uh, the, the lead on its development. Uh, Peter Carpenter and I helped with it. 
And um, in fact, we developed it as a tool for training. So I'd certainly recommend that to you. Um, one of my own staff colleagues here was recently training um, SBRs in the London area, and quite a number of them are using this. Again, when they suspect that a patient they've seen is autistic, uh, often the difficulty they have is their trainer, their consultant doesn't know enough about autism to be able to help them, so they're left with that. Now, a much, much more expanded version of this is the, the Schedules for Clinic Assessment in Neuropsychiatry, which has been expanded into autism and ADHD. Um, we're, we haven't published that yet, but we will be publishing that in the next year or two. If anybody wants to know more about that, please do get in touch. There are lots of questionnaires out there and we did have to use in the two-phase survey design for this survey, the autism quotient, which was developed in Cambridge and is used widely in its shortest form, the 10 item form by GPs to help decide who sh they should refer for an assessment for autism. But free, it's not very good. There are a few discrete settings in which we've tested, evaluated and shown that it does have some value. And one of them, although I don't think anybody has ever done this, is to screen all admissions to adults inpatient psychiatric units. Because it does have sufficient sensitivity and specificity in that context to pick out adults whose autism has never been previously considered by them or by anybody else who might actually merit having an autism assessment. Um, the proportion of adults on inpatient units now who are being recognised with autism is improving. Um, next slide. <clears throat> if we could have the next slide, please. All right. So um, this is the next key thing about really any sort of epidemiological approach. Um, so next bullet point. Um, yeah. So. Um, they're basically active and passive approaches to epidemiological work. And the passive approach is, is a good example, is that CDC work I mentioned earlier, where you um, essentially go to educational health records and then you look at the material there and you have a, obviously a, a criterion definition for deciding which meets a uh, definition for autism or any other condition you might want to study. But it's very passive because you've really no control over which children actually have records and there are many children as we know and indeed most adults with autism up, up to certainly recently were completely undiagnosed so uh, and even that variation across the United States shows the same thing that there's a failure to actually uh, have any records or any question or any consideration about many of the children who actually do need that question so at the sampling level it's a very passive process and then in terms of the assessment well the the researchers are not doing any assessment they're just looking at other people's records, which were collected for educational reasons or clinical reasons, not for epidemiological reasons. So those record creators were not necessarily following any particular definition or, or rubric, although they probably were following one of, of several different ones. So case identification, in that sense, is completely passive. You're completely um, um, reliant on... Um, the, the individuals who made those records. So research that relies on records and 99% of the epidemiological information on autism and adulthood around the wor world is based on this passive approach to both case identification and sampling, which was being used by the Global Burn Disease Programme until they uh, and I got into some deep conversations over the last few years. They still to some extent have done so, but I think they're going to be doing a very interesting report in the next year on autism, in which they attempt to really confine the data that they use to these more active approaches, which is where an epidemiological survey really comes in. So as a surveyor, I, I define who's going to be sampled. It's a random process. Um, I'll have some references at the end. Those who want to read the articles in greater depth will see how meticulous and carefully put together that is originally by the OPCS and then ONS and now by NATSEN in, also in London. And then the case identification process, well, I said I developed this um, with the consultation process I've already described, and we ended up deciding to go for the ADOS. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, so this is actually a little bit about uh, what we found in terms of associations. I'm not actually going to tell you what we found in terms of prevalence, because I think it'd be better if you read, read, read the articles around that. But it's often quoted, so it's not that difficult to come across. And when I Google searched it, actually one of the sources did come up. 
Um, the first bullet point there is that the prevalence of autism in children is variously argued. And um, there have been two very good surveys now of children, that's up to the age of 16 in, in, in England. The first one in 2003, which was done by uh, ONS, and the more recent one by NATSEN, which is the, probably the biggest independent social survey organization in the country with a hu huge amount of work that they do for central government. And essentially the prevalence of autism childhood, that's in 2003 and in 2017, which is the last time they did a full survey, essentially hadn't changed very much. So around about 1%, um, the point of prevalence had varied slightly, but when you take account of the confidence intervals, uh, there really wasn't a significant change. And that's probably the most robust evidence anywhere on the planet that there isn't an autism epidemic. You heard it here first. Um, moving on then. Um, yes, the adult work, which I've been involved in, um, began in 1993, but we incorporated autism in 2007. And we did it again in 2014. Um, it's a much cruder estimate because we don't find very many people in our interviews using the ADOS in the community who have autism. So the confidence centers are very wide. We're about to do a third survey and that will help because when you've got three, you, you're in a position to then look, about, look at trends. Uh, we're going to also incorporate the scan interview, so we may actually be, and we're going to do some other changes to the design, so we may actually be able to make, come up with a more robust estimate. But certainly the two surveys in 07 and, and 14, there was no real change in, in the prevalence. Um, but the associations there in the bottom uh, bullet point, uh, no surprises there, low IQ. Epilepsy, you've just had a, a, a very useful talk on that, very clear association, even in the somewhat meager data that we collected on adults, um, published in a very nice article by Dheeraj Rai. Um, and then there's a couple of knots. So people with autism are unlikely to be in a stable long-term relationship. Uh, and another knot was age. Um, I mean, there is some evidence that people with autism don't live as long as other people. So there is a survival issue there. I think the evidence is not great, but it's moving in that direction. Uh, we didn't find a significant association with age. In other words, in a sense, what we're saying is that the prevalence is pretty much the same across the years up to about retirement age and very few people beyond that age that we were actually able to assess. I myself suspect that the prevalence does fall off with increasing age, and we've seen that in the intellectual disability part of the population, which we've now looked at, uh, and combined it with the, the main sort of household survey. Um, and um, this could be linked, I think, to, to the, the shortened lifespan of people with neurodevelopmental disorders, and this may well apply to autism as well. There's certainly a, a, an association with self-harm and suicide. Uh, a lot of evidence of that coming out. That's another thing that to bear in mind. Uh, next slide, please. So the clinical implications, we've got just a few minutes before I stop and give people a chance to put a question in the, in the chat if they haven't already done so, please do. Um, A very good question to all of us really as clinicians and practitioners, how many cases have I missed in my career? And I'm very open about the fact that I didn't manage to get good, decent training in adult ADHD until about 10 years ago, and I got that from Phil Asherson. I had been trying over the previous decade or longer to find that. We even had a, a day on the topic here in our trust, um, quite a few years before that, and it just really just didn't hit the mark at all. And someone like Phil Asherson who really understands a topic like ADHD as it affects ordinary people in their all, all daily lives and not just within the context of clinical work. That's the way to learn about these things. And when I'm teaching about autism, I ask everybody in the group, uh, after a brief description has been sort of put up, say, who do you know who's like that? And everybody in the room can think of somebody that they know who's like that. Now, whether that person is autistic or not is a different question, but at least it's the first step on the road to finding out. Um, 
So we did a survey of people attending adult mental health services in Northamptonshire and Leicestershire, and we found one in 20, um, that paper's referenced, by the way, at the end, um, actually met criteria on the ADOS um, in a sort of a two-stage design. Um, Sam Trums has since uh, given a number of talks and he's just finalizing the paper now. And on the inpatient side, he found one in 10. Now he found that about half of those were recognized. So it was actually on the case file, but that means that if you like one in 20 uh, patients admitted to Leicestershire inpatient wards and a couple of other trusts uh, in the East of England, had autism and it wasn't being recognized. But that seems to be a big improvement on the earlier study. We did the earlier study in about 2011, just looking at all adults contacting mental health services. Uh, one in 20 had autism. Hardly any of them had an autism code had been recognized or picked up. And this is in a, in a part of England where there were diagnostic services up and running throughout that period. So these are the numbers as practitioners you need to think about, because if you're recognizing that number in, in working in those uh, clinical settings, then good for you. But if you're not, then you're missing cases. I certainly would have missed cases of ADHD over the years. I'm quite happy to acknowledge that. And the fact that you are actually on this seminar today means you want to learn more. So that's, that's good. Um, so, um, the other thing is, is I suppose that it needs to be looked at in your population. I mean, it could be that the rates that we've come up with in these settings would be different in other places. So don't assume that just because we've published evidence for one setting that it applies everywhere else. Uh, next slide, please. So, and the next slide, please. Okay, so, and the next slide, please. So that's some further reading. I haven't got everything there, but you'll be able to find links to other things there. It includes our epidemiological work. Uh, the second last item there is a, a big overview of also published in a Nature Review journal, um, which I think is, is certainly my favorite sort of thought of source on the topic in general. At the very end there, and this is one of my conflicts of interest, I get uh, royalties from Oxford University Press for, I get a few pence per copy, believe it or not, something called the Psychiatry of Adult Autism and Asperger's Syndrome. Uh, happy to declare that as a conflict of interest, but I'd strongly encourage those of you who want to, to work well within psychiatry practice with adults, uh, that's designed for you. Please go for it. Uh, right, a few moments for any questions in the chat or whatever. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Terry, for this very interesting talk. Uh, we have a few questions. Um, we don't have time for everything, but I will. I think I will select the um, the ones with the most prevalence. Um, so, <laughs> so yeah, I have one question here about. Um, my understanding of the question is about the sensitivity of ADOS in women and girls population. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Well, uh, maybe they are masking. Do the assessors take collateral from family? Yeah. Um, uh, well. Yeah. Sure. Sure. I'll always ask this question. Very good question. <laughs> when you repeat things, things replicate. Fantastic. It's great. Um, I think there's, there's possibly something in that. Uh, that's one of the reasons we've developed the interview. So the clinical interview, which is, the, the, is also the short college interview that I mentioned, but also the scan interview, which we are beginning to train people in, uh, the autism part of it, is, is designed, essentially it extends the mental state examination that all of you psychiatrists, psychopathologists out there learned many years ago. It just extends it into autism and ADHD. ADHD is far less challenging, much more straightforward. So, and we're not finding, I mean, I think we designed, one of the reasons we designed it was to make sure that we were asking the right questions that would help women who have autism to describe what it's like to be autistic. And it certainly brings out their stories about masking. Um, now, you've got to remember the ADOS was developed not by a man, but by a woman, as indeed the DISCO and to some extent the ADI, that's a colossal irony. So. It's, it just goes to show these things are not easy and nobody should be blamed for any of this stuff. 
But one of my references there is some of the most recent major publication, 2016 British Journal of Psychiatry, where we combined the intellectual disability learning difficulties population with the household verbally able. In other words, we're covering the entire range of ability. What we found is, yes, the prevalence in males is far higher in males than in females in the able verbal population. And that's very much based on the ADOS, I quite agree. Uh, but in the intellectual, the moderate to profound intellectual disability group, the prevalence is pretty much the same in men and women. And I suppose you could translate, I could explain that in a number of ways, and I'll try and be quick about this because it's time for another question maybe, but the, the more able women are probably better at masking and girls, teenage girls, are interested in social interaction and, and so on. They teach each other. And the intelligent autistic girl is learning, uh, or woman, if you prefer the term, depending on the age, is observing around themselves and they're learning. They're using the intellectual part of their brain to consciously mask and act and uh, what they call faking it. And they find it completely exhausting and tiring. You don't ask about being exhausted and tired in the ADOS, but you certainly do in the scan interview. And I'll finish on that point. Oh, thank you very much. Um, there is a following question from that. Uh, why is the prevalence not increasing in women where many girls uh, and women are being diagnosed than previously? Well, I don't think we, 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 I don't, I don't think we actually know whether it's changing in women or not, because these prevalence estimates um, are, the I mean, majority of the cases are males. So, the numbers we're giving are largely the male epidemiology of autism rather than the epidemiology of autism in all individuals. Um, I can't speak so much for, for, for children there because it's not an area that I work in, so I probably need to think about that. And you might want to ask that of somebody who does work in that area. But on the adult side, most of our prevalence rate is based on males. Um, now, whether the I, I think recognition in females may well be changing, but the, the underlying race, there's no reason why it should be changing. Um, I mean, most of the causes of autism are, are inherited causes. Uh, we're getting to know more and more about the environmental factors. And, and um, the other thing I would say, and this is actually very important, this is really, as I say, hot from the press. There's a couple of papers in psychological medicine very recently from the Bristol birth cohort. And they're showing something which is really quite revolutionary, which is that uh, the presence of autistic traits can change quite considerably between the age of five and the age of 15, okay? And the idea that, um, and, and we, I think we observe this in our clinical work, we see people presenting as young adults who come across as being quite autistic, but when you get a developmental history on their early childhood, they're not. And up to now, the rules say you can't diagnose autism unless they had autism as a child. And I'm, I'm coming around very quickly to the thought that that's actually wrong. Although I would say that the prognosis for somebody who develops autistic traits in, in their teenage years beyond is probably a lot better. And within that story, we're also seeing um, girls who are relatively free of autistic traits in their primary school years, if we can call it that, who, once they get into their teen years, are actually diagnosable. So there's far more fluctuation going on in terms of the presence of autism, if you like, across that age span. We don't know about the rest of the age span. We'll have to see. We'll all have to live long enough to see what Allspack would teach us about people in their 50s and 60s. I don't know that I'll be around that long, actually. Um, um, but it is much more of a fluctuation condition than we think. And there's more on that I'd love to say, but that would be another talk. <laughs> Thank you very much for interesting talk. Very thought provoking. There are more questions, but I'm afraid we're out, we're out of time. Um, well, if it's possible, Professor Brugger, if you can answer this on the chat box, or if you can answer by email later on, we'll really appreciate it. Thanks again. And uh, I will over to the next speaker. Thank you. Our next speaker, Kobus van Resenberg, who will give us a talk on ADHD update. Uh, Kobus is a consultant clinical psychologist with more than 29 years experience in the field of neurodevelopmental conditions. He is the team leader of the adult ADHD and Asperger's, in North, uh, Asperger's team in Northamptonshire, which he established in 2003. 
as one of the first community team of its kind in the United Kingdom. So without further ado, over to you, Corbus. Thank you very much, uh, Hisham. I'm just gonna open up my slides and hopefully we can all um, see that. There we go. There are my disclosures. I want you to imagine that you are um, sailing out in the open sea and your boat capsizes. You lose your GPS function, so no one can actually track you, um, but you manage to get an SOS through to search and rescue and, um, and they're starting to look for you. So have you ever wondered how a search and rescue team would go about looking for someone in a big area. So imagine this is the area that they need to look at. Um, some of you might be familiar with the expanding square. So you start somewhere in the middle and then you just uh, continue to go wider and wider. But what if there's a drift? What if there's wind? So you're moving as well. Um, and, uh, and one of the approaches that people will use is uh, called the Victor Sierra search. So imagine then going forward in this direction and someone looking towards the left and someone stands on the other side and they look towards the right. And then they continue with this sort of triangular shape and um, try and cover that area uh, to uh, see if they can find uh, your boat. Now you might wonder why I am mentioning this. I'd like you just to hold the, the, the kind of the image in your mind for a, a, a little longer and I'll come back to, um, to where I'm going to use this analogy. The aims of today is to provide from a clinical perspective, so not so much from a research perspective, but very much from a um, clinical service pers perspective, an update on a few things. The first one is, is just how services had to deal with the very steep increase in referrals that we have seen during the pandemic. Um, going to focus on what a good quality diagnostic assessment should look like. I think people have an idea, um, but um, do we really know what, what a good quality assessment looks like? So I'm going to focus on the importance of asking open-ended questions, refining our observation skills. So um, the ADHD world doesn't have something like Terry has just mentioned, like the ADOS. Um, but how do we refine our observation skills during ADHD assessments? The importance of identifying ADHD-related impairment and then identifying when people with ADHD can actually focus and when they can relax. I'm also going to spend a bit of time on the importance of offering a wider range of treatment options. And I will point you towards some of the recent consensus statements that that um, have been published in recent years. We are uh, right next to uh, Terry's County in Northamptonshire, and uh, we started our service in 2003 with a focus on those three conditions, ADHD, autism, not, not a learning disability, but um, uh, we were um, called the Asperger team and, um, and then Tourette's disorder as well. Since then, we've kept an eye on every single referral we have received. And, 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 and over these years, we've received 13,000 referrals. And, and that has made us repeatedly update uh, our pathways, kept refining it. And we've still not stopped with that, especially now in the pandemic. And what's happened is this. We were receiving about 10 referrals a month. Um, and it didn't go up much initially. And then, as you can see, in the last year, it's just completely shot up from 111 per month to 199, so just about 200. We were receiving on average per month by, by the end of, of 2021. Uh, we definitely did not um, expect this, but we see a similar trend in, in, in other services and we are still trying to explain what might, might have happened. Uh, we also noticed that 
um, our referral sources um, change, change slightly as well. So we used to get around 60% of our referrals from GPs. This has gone up to 75% in the pandemic. And I've actually asked the two lead GPs recently whether they can explain what, what, is, ha what is happening here. And how can we now get 92% more referrals in a single year? Um, and, and although uh, there might be many reasons, they, they tend to think that maybe if you've got undiagnosed ADHD and undiagnosed uh, autism, then, um, then you were really going to struggle during the pandemic. Um, you were um, going to get less support um, because you were uh, often home-based. And, um, and especially for people with ADHD, who then had to organize themselves much better at home. Um, maybe uh, in, in environments that they didn't prefer, um, that might explain some of the, the significant increase in referrals in this period of time. So the challenges for services, if, if you imagine that, that we are getting, um, well, we are getting around 230 referrals a month now. Uh, one week recently, we, we touched on, on 80 in a single week. Uh, that that is just unmanageable to 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 manage that type of of number. So we are constantly asking ourselves, how can we streamline services? How can we um, save literally minutes uh, in in what we offer? Uh, and at the same time, we have to protect the quality of our assessment. So how short can it be, um, um, so that you know you're still making a very good clinical um, judgment. So we are not looking here at the gold standards. We are simply looking at what's the absolute minimum that you need to do to, um, to complete an assessment. So my first question, and as I'd be really grateful if you could just answer this in, um, in the Q&A um, um, bit, is, is how much direct clinical time do you or your team spend on average with patients during a full ADHD diagnostic assessment. So this might not apply to all of you, um, but I'd be really um, keen to know how much time do you spend? This is not um, uh, reviewing the notes beforehand or looking at questionnaires or writing your report. Just like to know how much time do you spend? Uh, if you are the only one doing the assessment, then, then just kind of give an estimate of how much time you spend with an ADHD uh, uh, patient, um, but if if um, if someone else in your team is also also involved, then just put in the total time. Um, so I'd be really grateful if you could just quickly put that um, in the Q and A function. All right, thank you. Two hours, sixty to ninety minutes, uh, one and a half, three hours, two to three hours, five hours. Um, you can immediately hear there's a big um, uh, range here uh, of, uh, of answers, uh, uh, as, as little as 60 minutes and um, as much as, as five hours. So there's more five hours, two hours direct, uh, three hours non-direct, two to three hours, four to five hours. Uh, th this is very interesting, isn't it? How do we know? How do we know? Know, uh, when we can stop? How do we know if we've asked enough questions now? How do we know we've covered all areas of the, the diagnostic assessment? So we are at a time now when we have to ask this question. How much time do I need to put aside? How short can it be? But also, uh, what can I not leave out? And I'd like to explore this um, in the next few slides. So thanks for those answers. Uh, Actually, before that, say one or two here. So do you always offer the full diagnostic assessment? So if someone comes to you, do you just say, okay, we're going to do the whole assessment? Or do you actually offer some form of, of, of screening, some, some triage? Uh, first? So if you could just pop that again in the Q&A, that'll be great. Um, some people are offering a screening appointment. 
Someone triages after the referral. Um, Someone's looking at the quality of the referral from GPs. That's really important. Um, screening, screening, screening after triage. That's good to hear. Uh, Terry, you might still hear me, um, but um, I can so clearly recall many years ago, we sat in your office and, uh, and we talked about the importance of screening. And, um, and we both agreed that that, that screening um, is best done if it's done by the people with the most experience. Um, and that's very often not the case uh, in that some teams um, do not um, put their most experienced people at, if, at the front end, if you like. They, they come sort of in later on. And that is very difficult when your resources are very, very thin and you can't, um, you know, you can't spend that time. So what is your assessment approach? If you, if you see someone, uh, is, is this what you do? You, you say, well, there are nine inattention symptoms. So I'm going to go down the symptom list and I'm going to just wait for the yes and the no. I count the number of yeses. And, and then I might say, well, it's um, if it's for children, yes, it's six or more. If it's for adults, it's five or more. And you do exactly the same for hyperactivity and impulsivity. You go down these lists and you, you count the number of symptoms. But what's the problem with this approach? If, if this is what we are going to do, um, what, what problems might we run into if we are simply going down lists? Um, couldn't the GP then just do that and, um, and do that, that on our behalf or, or even the patient themselves? The one key issue is that ADHD symptoms are very common in the general population. So if we ask close questions, just yes or no, uh, we are going to have loads of false positives and we might not even know uh, that that's the case. I always say to my, my patient when, when I'm at that point when I offer them the, the diagnosis that there's not a single ADHD diagnosis that is unique to ADHD. They, they are, every single symptom is in the general population. But as clinicians, we need to remember that 97 out of 100 people do not meet the criteria for ADHD, despite um, it being very common in people uh, who haven't got ADHD. The other dilemma I think nowadays is that people come prepared. So they're much more informed. They know exactly uh, what you are looking at. Whereas I think in the past, uh, when I asked people, how much do you know about ADHD? They said, well, I don't really know much. You know, may maybe it's about hyperactivity or I can't concentrate. And, and they, they kept mentioning just two or three symptoms. But now people are much more aware. And, and you've got to keep that in mind when you are conducting your assessment. There are even some that would just simply expect you to confirm the diagnosis and could be really angry if, if you don't do that. But we cannot conduct these assessments like an exam where we simply base our decision on our patient's yes or no responses. Uh, we simply cannot look just for the correct answer. What we need to know as, as the diagnosticians is whether are you disorganized and someone says yes, what proof have you got? Um, how do you know that that is really um, an ADHD symptom, uh, as opposed to just ticking another yes. I think we forget that ADHD is not just about the clinicians just focus on the symptom side of the criteria. So we know that children need six or more of the inattention or um, six or more of the impulsivity, hyperactivity symptoms and, and adults five on each side. And, um, uh, and, and, and then there's obviously the impairment as well and, and, and how this interferes with someone's uh, social, academic and occupational functioning. Uh, I'm going to come back to this whole issue about um, the age of 12. And then the first thing which I haven't got on here is that it shouldn't be better explained by something else. And if we are only going to spend time looking at, at, at the symptoms there on the left, uh, then we are going to miss... Uh, 80% of what the criteria is about. We have to look for the impairment as it relates to ADHD as well. And we need to look at uh, their, their childhood um, developmental history as well to, to find out how and whether that was present as a child. 
The approach for going down lists and um, and ticking that uh, maybe one can um, compare with the track line approach uh, for searching someone. So search and rescue teams might sometimes take a track line approach, which is about um, when they know that someone is is definitely between here and point B. So it's a straight line. They go down the straight line and they they will find um, they just don't know how far that that is from where they are. Um, but this is a very sort of symptom-based approach and, and only looks at, at, the, um, at the A part of the criteria. And this is where I want to come back to this vector Sierra approach. Um, vector Sierra approach is also called the vector search, where to find whether someone's got ADHD is much more like this. It should be much more like this, where you look at a lot of things and in that way build your picture and then find out whether they've got uh, ADHD. So you might ask, so where do we go then from here? And what I find most helpful is, is to not do the symptoms first. I think this is, this is, this is not the best way of going down um, your, your diagnostic um, plan. It start with a developmental history and areas of impairment first. Ask about, I'll, I'll list that in a minute. I'll ask about those areas and things will start to become clear through that. Ask as many open-ended questions. Um, I'll, I will share with you those as well. Um, and definitely ask for personal examples, uh, again, in an open-ended way so that people can give you an example of how that ADHD symptom is present in their lives or not. We have to get informant information. I'm very worried when people routinely do not do this. It might not be that we always find the, um, you know, an informant, but we, we need to show that we've tried. Um, and um, as, as other speakers have mentioned earlier today as well, there are, um, there are so many comorbidities in ADHD. Comorbidity is the rule, it's not the exception. Um, I would say at least 60%, I, I tend to, to find that it's around 70%, um, and some people put it at 80%. Um, but we have to look at all the areas of comorbidity. So not just mental health comorbidity. As, as people have already mentioned today, we need to look at neurodevelopmental comorbidity. The, the comorbidity with dyspraxia or um, developmental coordination disorder is something like 50%. So how, how can we just skip over that? And, um, um, and then uh, medical comorbidities as well. Um, there's more and more evidence that um, that conditions like hypermobility and chronic fatigue syndrome um, could lead to ADHD symptoms. So, so how much do we explore that when we do our assessments? When you've done hundreds or perhaps a thousand of assessments like I've done, then uh, you start to pick things up. And myself and my colleague Arif, who's also a colleague of, um, of Terry, um, have started to identify very specific phrases that people with ADHD use in their answers when they, uh, when they answer our, our open-ended questions. Um, and, and we are finding that that's a helpful way uh, to distinguish between people who, who might have ADHD and those who haven't. And then very importantly, um, how much do you actually observe? Um, how much do you rely on what you actually see in your consultations? Now in, in lockdown, now that we um, see people via video so often, I, I can see that they, they walk and talk um, in a clinic setting. Uh, very occasionally they might want to get up, but in, in a, on a video call, um, it's, it's so, um, so common for, for, for our clients just to, to, to just walk <laughs> throughout the assessment. I, I've had people who were in supermarkets uh, during the assessment or driving um, with their family. And during the assessment, and and um, and we need to rely much more on our own observations as well, and not just focus on that yes/no kind of answers we are getting from our patients. And then, when you've done all of this, then you can go back to your 18 symptoms and only address those that's not already been answered. So we really need to move away from this this kind of 18 questions one by one. Um, and, and, uh, and, and trying to just answer them. Do the other stuff first and spontaneously people will give you the, um, the, the examples of symptoms if they are really present. 
much, much better way to be sure that someone's got these symptoms. A developmental history, as I've mentioned, is really important. And, and the problem here is that that is not always evident before the age of 12. We see, we use the word scaffolding, obviously, very often in, 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 um, in ADHD, uh, and this can mask the presence of some symptoms. Uh, especially the inattentive presentation might be missed because um, people have never really been in trouble. And, um, uh, and, and, and teachers will still say that they've got a lack of progress or, or not achieving their potential, but that's not seen as ADHD. That's just seen as laziness or, or kind of being unmotivated, whatever. And, and, and how much do we do? How much do we do to help teachers to understand the inattentive presentation, not just in girls, but also in boys. So during your assessment, you need to get as much information as possible. Uh, so even for adults, we try and get the school reports if they know where they've kept them. Um, I ask how they focused in different lessons. I always ask what's their favorite lessons? What, what were their, um, their worst lessons they could think of? I ask, um, uh, ask about what they did in break time, what they did after school, all these things. You can ask good open-ended questions so that it gives you an idea of where their ADHD symptoms were present and if they were present, to what extent they were impairing. The areas of life, I, I, I tend to divide roughly in, in three main areas. So the daily stuff of sleep, diet, exercise, health, um, just lifestyle things maybe. And, and in each of these areas, you can ask very specific questions as ADHD might impact on this. So I always ask people in terms of sleep, what time do you go to bed? And then what time do you fall asleep? I always ask, how would you describe your mind 10 o'clock at night? Uh, under diet, I will always ask things like, do you skip meals? Um, what do you crave? Do you drink fizzy drinks? Do you drink energy drinks? Um, in terms of exercise, we know that this is very good for people with ADHD, but just how do they manage that? How do they set up a routine for that? The next area would be the areas of responsibilities, obviously crucial for us because this is often why people come to us to get support in these, these areas. And once again, I will ask very specific questions as it relates to ADHD. This might be what makes you move from a job to another job because ADHD people will move between jobs for different reasons. They will say they get bored. They will say it was too repetitive. They will say um, they didn't like authority because they were boxed in by that. Um, they, they, they really dislike office jobs. So you do get a sense by asking open-ended questions in each of these areas. The studies could be influenced by every single inattention um, symptom. Ask about finances, important things. Just ask about how do you manage your daily chores, getting things done. Because if you ask questions about that, they will start telling you about how organized they are in a spontaneous way. And then you can decide whether that ticks that symptom, if you like, of um, number five on the inattention list. Uh, and then you don't have to go back to that. And then the other areas of life, which we just cannot skip in an ADHD assessment, we need to know how they spend their free time, um, how their ADHD symptoms, if they've got some, influences their friendships. Can they relax on holiday? Can they just read for pleasure? Loads and loads of things that you can ask to give you a sense whether someone's got ADHD and how that impacts on them. So we need to start identifying the presence of as many DSM-5 ADHD symptoms as possible when reviewing these areas well before we get to, to the list. Now, um, the, the box on the left is, um, is a really nice summary of, what, of how Philip Asherson sees ADHD symptoms um, and that we need to understand uh, and ensure that these inattention symptoms are related to a core underlying problem with attention regulation. Um, and then that the, on the other side, the hyperactivity and impulsivity um, is, uh, are present to a greater extent than peers and can present as difficulty in regulating behavioral um, responses. And then this is just a summary of what myself and Arif found. Uh, after doing countless um, assessments, uh, we were noticing these phrases and, ex and, and, and expressions people were using when we asked them 
um, questions and our, our hypothesis has been whether there is a specific language um, that might be unique to ADHD. Uh, when we've presented this to people from other countries, um, they, uh, they found that um, their patients in their countries were using exactly the same phrases in their own, in their own language. I'm going to just give examples of some of the inattention um, symptoms, some of the hyperactivity and one of the impulsivity symptoms as a way of asking open-ended questions. Unfortunately, I've not got time to go through um, all 18, but I, I thought I'll just show you uh, how I do it. So the first inattention symptom is about making careless mistakes and, and, and lacking attention to detail. Now, we know that underlying this is rushing. Um, and if you rush, you will make mistakes or you have to slow yourself down significantly to avoid making mistakes. So you can ask, you can check both these questions. And the things that the language stuff that people used um, are things like, I rush my work, I'm always the first to finish. I never use capitals, commas or full stop. So a good open-ended question could then be, how do you manage paperwork? Now, if you start with that question, just how do you manage paperwork? This is not a closed question. Um, people will start telling you um, how they do that. Very often the ADHD person will say, I just don't. Uh, I give that to someone else or I leave it to the last minute. If they say that, then you might start thinking, well, is the inattention um, symptom six? Is that, is that what they are talking about here? Are they procrastinating it? Are they avoiding this task because it requires mental effort? Then I've got to go back to them and say, uh, well, if you have to do it, if you have to fill in this questionnaire, and, and I can see you've done one for me, how did you do it? Uh, and this is where people will say, uh, yeah, I just rush it. And I say, and, and do you, you know, does it mean um, it's done after the first um, try? And they say, no, I have, to, I have to recheck it. I have to double check, triple check whether um, I've made any mistakes. Then you know the symptom is really present. I'm again going to ask you, um, to just record in the Q&A function, when can people with ADHD focus? Now, please don't put in here when they're on medication. This is not what I'm after here. Um, just what, what, what if your patients, your clients, the children, the adults that you've seen, what do they say? When can they concentrate? Because it's a myth that people with ADHD can't concentrate. They can, um, but there are many, many uh, areas and times that people with ADHD can concentrate. So um, just, um, just add a few, please, in, uh, in the box. Great. Yes, craft activities, video games, absolutely. When they're interested in something, computer games, console games, for hours on end, absolutely. Uh, their favorite subject, computer games, sports, online gaming. So there's a very clear theme there of, uh, of online stuff. Um, absolutely something that captivates them absolutely um thanks for that uh, i'm <laughs> i'm in the process of developing acronyms for this and um i keep coming up with new ones some of the words i need to, to to use as an acronym is getting longer and longer at the moment the acronym i'm using is investments and i've got one for every single lecture at the moment um but yes interest is there um and when things are stimulating or when it's new, um, when, um, when it's rewarding, it's there, um, when there's variety. So there's a lot of things where, and times when people with ADHD can focus and how can we help them to, to bring those things in when, um, when they are struggling. So one of my patients recently said um, to me, and she gave me loads of lovely examples of how she combined these things. So she said, um, I, uh, my ideal job would be to, to teach forestry outdoors, you know, so she would be moving, she would be outdoors, she would be engaging with people. She also said the only way she could study in the past was actually by sitting in a coffee shop. So it was noisy enough around there. She needed, she needed that, that kind of, if you like, that, that sensory overload almost to focus her mind. Um, people talk of focusing whilst they're driving. Now we know um, they, you know, many people with ADHD do um, struggle to concentrate when driving, but there are loads of people who, who are fine. Um, and that's when they can listen to a podcast um, or an audiobook. 
Let's move on to the fifth um, inattention symptom, uh, difficulty organizing uh, yourself. So this is about planning ahead, time management problems. Um, uh, being organized for some people could be very stre uh, stressful, but they're not naturally organized. So sometimes some patients will say to me here, um, this is the one area I haven't got a problem. I'm super focused, almost to the point of being obsessed about that uh, in an OCD way. Uh, and then I ask, are you naturally organized? And then they smile and they say no, because the effort they need to put in to organize themselves is not there. It's not naturally there. So they write things down. They leave planning to others. Um, they are very much spur of the moment people that take their day as it comes. So a nice open-ended question is just to ask, how do you plan your daily activities? Um, and if someone's not got ADHD, you will get a sense of that by asking this open-ended question. Whereas someone with ADHD will quickly tell you how disorganized their life is. Hyperactivity, uh, I'm going to look at the first one, fidgetiness. Now, this is an interesting one because I've seen people say to me, uh, they are so fidgety. And then I look at them and they're not fidgety at all. Or they say the opposite, they're not. And they are so fidgety. So you will observe this. This is one of those things that you will rate because you observe this, not just because of what they say. Now, if they sit on their hands, if their hands is in the pockets, they might inhibit fidgetiness. You know, so then you ask extra questions. But if someone sits there perfectly fine for an hour and a half or two hours and they don't seem fidgety, why would you score that then? Um, this is where your observation skills come in, not the answer your client is just giving you. Um, so um, people will say, yes, when they sit down, they just can't do nothing. They have to be doodling. They need something in their hands. The fourth one is an interesting one because in children, as you know, we look at where the children are, say, loud on the playground. But I don't find this a very helpful symptom to look at in adults because so many adults with ADHD are not loud. And as I was asking this question over the years, um, adults kept saying um, they're not loud, but they hate silence. And, um, and, and, and recently I saw this um, new way of looking at it there at the top, which is not a, so much about the adults being loud themselves, but having difficulty engaging in quiet, um, leisurely activities. So they need something around them. They need some background noise. That's very, very common. So just ask them, how do you manage silence? Um, and they will say, I'll, I'll break the silence somehow. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean they are loud. The last hyperactivity symptom is talking excessively. Now, I've got a problem with this one as well. I really hope they throw it out of DSM-6 one day. Because so many of our ADHD patients are not talkative. And if you're not talkative, you're unlikely to interrupt people. And you're unlikely to finish their sentences or answer quickly. So by not being talkative, is actually going to and and you and you yeah not not likely to be loud either. So just by not having this one symptom, is is significantly affecting some of the uh, the presence of the other symptoms. Um, and um, but there are there are obviously some people who are very um, talkative. Um, it's just not that common. And then I'm going to just list one impulsivity symptom here, which is um, the second one: difficulty waiting turn. Um, I find that people have numerous strategies for this one, but it is very, very common. Uh, people with ADHD have got significant difficulties to wait, and I just check with them how they manage the queue and how do they manage traffic. Um, someone said to me just yesterday, um, and, and this is so typical of ADHD, um, cannot be stuck in a queue, always the first one. To, to, to make a U-turn and go in the other direction, take a side road. Um, and he said, um, I take long cuts, <laughs> not shortcuts. I take long cuts. I just need to keep moving. Um, and, and, and so that's what ADHD is about. But there are then times when we just don't know how to score, if you like, these symptoms. Um, so what if someone just says, I don't know. I don't know if I'll miss details. I don't know if I, um, um, if I will make mistakes. Or they keep saying sometimes instead of definitely. Um, so you ask an open-ended question and they say, well, that definitely applies to me. And then if they give you an example, that's fine. But what if they keep saying, well, it depends on the situation. It depends on um, with who I am at that moment. Um, how do you end up scoring that if it's not there all the time, um, but there, there sometimes? And as I mentioned, what if it's not a problem? So if someone says, I talk for, for, for nonstop, um, but it's not a problem for me, you know, and it doesn't impair me. So it's not a symptom. 
doesn't doesn't I'm not bothered by being uh, loud or on the go. Um, and then, uh, especially with losing and misplacing things, I find that so many people have a clear strategy. They just say, "Well, I've got a safe." I've got a safe space for everything. So I don't lose things. Um, I don't ever look for things because I've got a strategy. But does it really mean that they know they've put it there? Is that not what we are looking for? And then the last one I find, I'm sorry, the, the second last one there is, um, is about being mentally on the go. So the fifth hyperactivity symptom, we probably see in children, they are physically on the go, but adults say they are mentally on the go, not physically on the go. And I really hope that, that in the future, again, in DSM-6, they just... They just change that to, 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 to the need to be mentally on the go and not physically on the go. Um, and then from time to time, people will say to me, I don't interrupt, but I want to. Um, and again, it makes me just think, well, aren't we really looking at the urge to interrupt as opposed to the act of interrupting? So there are a lot of questions we need to ask when we do an assessment to, to get a sense of whether someone's really got ADHD. And we will only be able to do that if we try and get a sense of what's behind the symptoms, what's driving the symptoms, as opposed to simply looking for what we can observe and see. So in summary, then, there are things on the one hand um, where, where we see that symptoms are present, but they are likely masked, like this last one I mentioned. So the urge is there, but you don't see it. Or we need to check is it actually a problem for them? Is it impairing? Um, and, and to know that requires us to take a very careful and detailed approach to our assessment. Some other good questions, uh, open-ended questions to ask is just what's the story of your life? How would your friends describe you? I like that one particularly. I mentioned the one at 10 o'clock at night. Um, what was it like getting ready for today's appointment? Um, and the, as I said, what made you move jobs? These are the things you could maybe observe. You could see whether they are late for your appointment, whether they didn't send back any paperwork, they had to call to check the time of the appointment. Fidgetiness, you'll see, you might see some distractibility. They might ask for short meetings. They might ask to stand. They might pace during a video call. Um, as I mentioned, in terms of fidgetiness, um, you might see hands and arms folded. Um, they could be talkative or not. And then on neuropsychological tests, you might see impulsivity um, and not listening specifically as well. Um, I'm aware of the time um, and therefore I might want to just um, skip through this. Um, I was going to ask you all to just list some positive things, but there are a lot of positive things. Feel free to list that maybe in the Q&A anyway. Um, but we do find that people with ADHD can think outside the box. They are great in an emergency. They are creative, innovative. They like solving problems there and then. Not so great with planning for things that needs to be solved in two weeks time. They can be very enthusiastic, um, very resilient, come up with great ideas that, that others don't. Um, I'm gonna just skip that slide um, because I, I'd like to just quickly touch on um, on the importance of also looking at, at, at other treatments. So if we simply say that the medication is there to reduce the symptoms, I'm, I'm challenging that because I think the medication reduces some of the symptoms. So we can't say we um, ate the, the medication treated their ADHD. No, it treated some symptoms of their, um, of their ADHD. And we need to look at the other things that they might want to do because this is the things they want to solve are the areas uh, in, in their studies, in work, in family, in relationships, and definitely improve their self-esteem. So it's very much quality of life stuff that we are looking at. Um, now, again, I'm not going to be able to stand still here, but I think you will all know that maybe you do not spend enough clinical time on the non-pharmacological side of things, and maybe you don't have the resources for that, and maybe all your resources goes into the, um, the medical treatment for um, for ADHD, but there's so much more that you can do. And, 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 and I think this is maybe also in line with, um, um, with um, Digby and, and, and Tom's presentations earlier today, is there's so much more that you can do. Um, that you can do a lot of very good psychoeducation. You can look at support networks. You can give um, extra support or arrange for extra support at, at work and, and, and studies. And there's loads of other strategies, especially um, uh, um, this, um, this 
a coaching approach is obviously also great for, for ADHD. But the problem is the problem is that most services just end up offering medication, getting someone on the right dose. And they do get better, obviously. Um, but a lot of things could remain um, un, un, unaddressed. Um, I will rather send these slides. This slide just um, tells you what we have been thinking to manage things better. So we're looking at IT solutions. We're looking at the front end of making GPs more aware of what we want um, and, and supporting other services to do the, the assessments um, as well. Um, and I also yeah, send the slide. So this is just for reference. There's a consensus document on females with ADHD. There's one for occupational therapy. Um, one for focusing on the failure of healthcare provision, and then a very good one that came out last year from Ferone and loads of other people uh, looking at 208 evidence-based consultations about, about ADHDs. You, you really want to look at this one. Um, there's, there's some just really good um, um, agreed statements that, that kind of confirms uh, where we are um, at the moment. So I think... I think I better stop there. That gives us five minutes for um, some questions. Wow, thank you very much, Kubas. That was, yeah, eye-opening for me at least. Um, yeah, and uh, certainly that was a very interactive talk, which actually showed me that, well, perhaps we all share in the world of uh, mental health services, the same pain, often the, the referral is required in some service so I hear that an assessment is carried out in one hour and then to conclude whether the patient has ADHD or does not have ADHD as a clinician myself I find that impossible and I don't think it's fair for the patient so thank you very much for putting light on that um, uh, well I have one question I know that many people have plenty uh, so please put them in the chatting box for Corpus to uh, reply to uh, on the break perhaps um, what would you suggest would be the or a better screening tool for our GP colleagues to use prior to make a referral? The AASRS is not very sensitive or well, not neither specific. Um, so, what do you suggest? Um, this is a very timely question. I, I have literally um, worked with uh, our lead GP uh, in the past week and with my oh, colleague. I, I, I might be psychic then. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you are. Uh, and, and with my colleagues just yesterday to actually finalize those questions. And we came up with, um, with it's, it's not completely open-ended, um, but it gives um, people, because if, if you ask, I think, um, someone to, to um, if they come to a GP and say, I've, I've got concentration problems. All right. So now the GP just needs to say, well, give me examples of that. You know, so we are helping GPs to then check um, for a specific example um, and then also for how much they are affected by that. Because otherwise we just get countless referrals from GPs, one line referrals sometimes just saying, patient says they can't concentrate, please assess. And, and, and we are helping them. Well, actually our GP himself came up with all these great questions. <laughs> so, uh, so we've got this, this questionnaire that we are now, it's, it's sort of a, in a draft uh, pilot kind of um, state now where we're gonna see whether that improves the, um, the, the, the quality of referrals we, we get. Um, so, um, so that we, we want specific examples of, of either disorganization, of inattention, hyperactivity, and then impulsivity if that's present, um, but then also just checking very early on um, in what areas of life that, that is impacting on, on them. Yeah. Um, you, wanna, you wanna even help your GPs not to go down the closed question route, I think. Absolutely. And uh, I get, um, well, I, you can guess what the next question is. Would that be available or would it be, well, is it just restricted to this pilot? No, no um, once we are um, happy with it, um, we, we'd be more than happy to, to share that. Um, I'm also working very actively on, um, on, on, a, on a very detailed, very structured diagnostic assessment, you know, with as many open-ended questions clearly stated so that, um, so that people can either add their own or, or kind of, you know, use that. Um, I, I think uh, you, you are so right. Uh, uh, 
I've probably done a thousand assessments, if not more, and, and I cannot get under two hours. Oh, and, I, and I usually cannot get under two and a half hours. And I, I force myself sometimes to kind of just speed up. But that conversation I have with the patient after I've diagnosed them, that's the most important bit. That's, that's, that's when I connect with them. That's when I hear how they feel about just being diagnosed. I don't just go straight for the, you know, like for the treatment plan there. They've got loads to say. So how I visualize it myself is that if I see 55-year-olds and I see many of them, I'm, I'm, I'm at that intersection in their life you know 55 years without a diagnosis with something they've been born with and they're going to have that for the rest of their life how, how can i only spend an hour with them mm. um and, and and get through the questions and give them time to reflect on that as well uh, it's a massive thing for them to be diagnosed Absolutely. Um, um, and it, it, we are that at that transition point where we need to give them hope um and uh, indeed mm. yeah thank you very much again um, so we will have a break now for 15 minutes and we'll be back by a quarter past three, please. Thank you. Welcome back, everyone. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Professor Andrea Cavana. Professor Cavana is a consultant in behavioral neurology at the Department of Neuropsychiatry in the National Center for Mental Health and is Associate Professor in Neuropsychiatry at the University of Birmingham. He is the lead consultant for Special Tourette Syndrome uh, Clinic at the Department of Neuropsychiatry in Birmingham and Deputy Director of MSc in Clinical Neuropsychiatry in Birmingham. Andrea has published extensively in the field of behavioral neurology and neuropsychiatry and focus on behavioral aspects of movement disorders and epilepsy. In 2010, he received the American Neuropsychiatric Association Career Development Award. Andrea today will give us a talk on the nosology of Tourette syndrome and other tick disorders. Over to you, Andrea. Many thanks, uh, Hisham, eh, for the very kind um, introduction. I would also like uh, to thank uh, Rafael Farouki for uh, um, organizing this, uh, inviting me, and uh, Karen uh, Morgan for the admin uh, support. So what I'll do now is uh, I'll try to share the screen and uh, uh, please uh, feel free to speak up if you can't uh, uh, see the slides or if you can't hear uh, me. Okay, so I'll try to say something about uh, uh, tick disorders uh, uh, focusing on Tourette syndrome, eh, the condition that we tend to see most um, often uh, in clinic. Um, this is my uh, long-standing interest in a way. Um, I've been uh, running the specialist Tourette syndrome clinic for 15 years in Birmingham. And uh, I've, uh, uh, it's I, I can't deny that uh, it's uh, been uh, growing uh, on me, so to speak. I became uh, more and more passionate about this condition, which is really uh, the interface between uh, neurology and psychiatry. And I'm a behavioral neurologist by training. So I come from the field of adult uh, neurology and I developed an interest in the behavioral aspects of um, uh, neurological uh, conditions, as uh, you rightly said, movement disorders and epilepsy. And within movement disorders, I found this condition uh, as uh, particularly fascinating. So I'm well aware that uh, it's, it's, I mean, the, the program is great and uh, it's quite intense though, and I appreciate your effort in following uh, this uh, uh, talk. Uh, as you can see, there's a good evidence from research that the attention span, you know, is, is, level of attention is quite good at the very beginning, then uh, inevitably it, it drops and uh, I can be no exception. So I'm prepared for that. I take no offense. And then uh, it will uh, hopefully raise again towards the end. So what I will do is uh, I'll give my best shots at the beginning and at the end, <laughs> according to the evidence base, uh, based sort of uh, uh, state of the art on, on uh, uh, presentations. And of course, everything I share with you today 
has been uh, written down in these books, uh, and I refer you to those. It's far better explained there. I'm not a very good speaker at all, so I refer you to the, the, the written text, okay? You're so an excellent ethics... speaker, Andrea, carry on. <laughs> yeah, please. Please. No, sorry, I was just saying you're an excellent speaker, Andrea. Sorry, I left my mic on. So sorry. <laughs> no, it was a morale boosting uh, uh, interruption. So I'm grateful for that. And uh, um, so tics are uh, the symptoms, and Tourette syndrome is the syndrome, as the name says. So it's the condition. Uh, and when we talk about tics as symptoms, uh, let's have uh, things uh, clear from the start. Tics are the most common hyperkinetic disorder in children. So if you have a hyper uh, uh, mobile, if you want a, a child with um, extra movements, involuntary movements, uh, chances are that these are ticks. And then you start uh, looking around for possible differential diagnosis, stereotype is your name it eh? also depending on whether there's also other neuro neurodevelopmental disorders associated. If we look at the actual figures, uh, eh, they're stunning, I would say. Tick disorders uh, uh, affect one in five children. So that means a few in every classroom. Uh, and these chances are that uh, mild, uh, even transient, uh, sort of benign childhood ticks. But uh, there's also the 1%, so one in a hundred, who have full blown Tourette syndrome chronic motor and vocal tics from childhood, from, uh, you know, when the brain is still developing, it develops with the tics. Uh, and uh, that's quite uh, uh, challenging uh, for uh, uh, clinics. Uh, and it's a common, if you think about it, in every school, no? there are a few children who have full-blown Tourette syndrome. It's also a very fascinating condition. And uh, if it, it comes uh, uh, from me, it means nothing. But uh, if it's said uh, by two giants of uh, modern uh, uh, neuropsychology and neuropsychiatry, like uh, Oliver Sacks and Alexander Luria, it does mean something. This is a letter, they, they had a correspondence. Uh, you know, uh, Luria died a few years ago. Uh, Sachs died not so many years ago. Uh, their lives overlapped and uh, they had these, uh, correspondence about these fascinating, uh, challenging, puzzling, intriguing clinical cases. So they were used to, to, to study uh, intriguing neurological conditions. Well, Luria wrote to Sachs that uh, there's nothing like Tourette syndrome. So he, he really saw something revealing in the study of Tourette syndrome, something that can tell us more uh, about human nature something that make us move and shout uh, when we don't mean it, okay? Um, the current definition of tics, well, this has been stable for quite uh, some time. Uh, involuntary, sudden, rapid, recurrent, non-rhythmic, contrary to tremor, which is defined by rhythm, for instance. Movements uh, or vocalizations. Um, I put a stereotype into brackets uh, because in the current edition, in the DSM-5, uh, that word has been uh, uh, removed, uh, not to uh, in, uh, cause confusion with uh, stereotypes. But ticks are stereotyped. Uh, they come back always in the same fashion, in the same individual, and so on. If we look uh, at uh, the actual syndrome, so Tourette syndrome, uh, we see that uh, the diagnostic criteria, again, uh, have remained uh, quite stable uh, since uh, 2000. At the turn of the millennium, with the DSM-4 text revision, with that particular edition of the DSM, when they removed the impairment criterion, uh, since then, there have been virtually no changes or only uh, minor adjustments. You see that you still qualify for Tourette syndrome if you develop tics uh, when your brain is still developing, so by the age of 18, if you have at least two motor tics plus at least one phonic tic, also called vocal tics. If uh, they involve the vocal cords, like vocalizations, uh, they are more appropriately <laughs> referred to as uh, uh, vocal tics. But something like grunting, sniffing, or throat clearing uh, are better referred to as phonic tics. The first uh, tic at uh, 
onset uh, is usually a motor tick. It's usually eye blinking. And the average age at onset is six. And ticks are three to four times more common in boys than girls. And uh, as I said, with the DSM-5, there have been a little changes. So this slide, apart from allowing me to show a picture when I didn't have white hair, it, it, it doesn't add much to, to what I already told you. Uh, transient tick disorder is currently referred to as provisional tick disorder. Again, more appropriately, because uh, in order to establish whether a tick disorder recently developed by a youngster is going to remain and to become chronic or is going to go away. Eh? So it's a benign transient uh, childhood uh, tick disorder. You need to follow the patient up eh? six months, one year. Um, so when you first meet the patient, everything you can say, it's a provisional <laughs> tick disorder. And then you refine your diagnosis. Where does it sit in the current classification system? Well, it's a neurodevelopmental disorder, hence my <laughs> talk today is a conference. But what I want to highlight with this slide is that Tourette syndrome is one of the very few conditions, if not the only condition, that has a place in both neurological and psychiatric classification systems. So you find tick disorders in the movement disorder society classification system, together with a TREM or myoclonus, dystonia, you name it. And you equally find tick disorders in the DSM. Consider that other neuropsychiatric movement disorders, like for instance, Huntington disease, don't have the privilege of being shared by both neurologists and psychiatrists. So Tourette syndrome uh, is, is, is really uh, quintessentially uh, neuropsychiatric par excellence. And uh, the story was born, uh, the scientific story of Tourette syndrome was born uh, towards the end of the 19th century in Paris at the Salpetriere Hospital, where the father of us all, neurologist and psychiatrist, the father of us all, Jean-Martin Charcot, was uh, uh, founding, establishing a modern neuropsychiatric school. So uh, this is perhaps the most famous painting in the whole history of neurology and psychiatry. And you find Charcot delivering his uh, case demonstration, his world round, so to speak, eh? uh, every Tuesday, uh, La Sonde Mardi, every Tuesday was giving these uh, demonstrations with patients. And you see that, that uh, Gilles de la Tourette is uh, sitting in the first row there. So it was Charcot's favorite pupil, really. And it was actually Charcot who asked uh, Gilles de la Tourette to write up the first case series of patients with tick disorders and Tourette syndrome was born. The year was 1885, so just two years before this painting. And uh, um, another note uh, from uh, this uh, uh, famous uh, picture is that uh, if um, we Imagine that uh, the same meeting that takes place uh, nowadays uh, in 2022. Uh, this is what uh, it would probably look like. Uh, it would be a Zoom meeting at the Salpetriere and the people would be like us joining remotely. Anyway, we try to do the same thing with different technology, eh, as they say. Uh, the life of Gilles de la Tourette was interesting in itself. He was shot by one of his patients. You might be interested in knowing that he survived. That was uh, like a superficial wound. Uh, but uh, uh, it was uh, one of his patients who suffered from hysteria. That, that was a Charcot school main interest. She was treated with hypnosis. She was clearly not particularly satisfied with the treatment she had received. She came back to Gilles de la Tourette's consulting office, hiding a gun in her bag, and she shot him. But uh, as I said, he didn't die. He made the front 
cover of the magazines of uh, the bourgeois <laughs> of uh, the Parisian society, but he didn't die because of that. He died, though, a few years later out of uh, tertiary syphilis. So you might uh, speculate whether she got a revenge over him in other ways. And uh, this is the actual uh, case series that uh, Gilles de la Tourette produced uh, after uh, Charcot uh, summoned him and instructed him uh, to, to, to carry out uh, these clinical observations. Um, nine patients who shared the clinical triad of uh, tics, both motor and phonic tics, echolalia, which is a complex vocal tic repeating other people's words, uh, and uh, coprolalia, which is uh, the swearing tic, involuntary swearing, out of context, when you don't mean it. It's a complex vocal tic. Patient number one was nicknamed the, the cursing Marquise. She was a French noble woman, Marquise de Dampierre. And uh, by now, you understand the, where her nickname came from. She caused a huge scandal in the 9th century Paris. But, uh, she was, uh, her case was um, written up by another French doctor, Itard, and uh, Gilles de la Tourette wrote, read Itard's case report and he redescribed her, adding to her case description eight other patients with the same clinical presentation. Um, it's the first time I mentioned coprolalia, but um, if you uh, follow the media or uh, TV or whatever, that's the first thing they mention when they speak about Tourette syndrome. I'd say quite inappropriately. Coprolalia is known to be an accessory symptom. It's no longer in the DSM criteria. Yeah? And uh, only 30% 30%, so one in three patients that we see in clinic, so referral bias with more severe complex cases, also have coprolalia as part of their tick repertoire. If we look at Tourette syndrome in the general community, schools, registries, and so on, percentage of coprolalia is even lower. It's about 10%. So it becomes very much an accessory symptom. Um, the prevalence of uh, Tourette syndrome, as we have said at the very beginning, is uh, 1%. Eh? Other uh, meta-analyses and systematic literature reviews uh, give um, a range of prevalence figures uh, from 0.3 to 0.9%, so bordering the 1%. And that's true for every culture eh, all around the world. So there's a strong biological underpinning whether you go in Far East, uh, Africa, North America, they all present with these uh, symptoms. Most common uh, motor tics uh, affect the face, eye blinking, facial grimacing, uh, um, mouth pulling, mouth opening, uh, um, eye rolling. And then you move down, you, know, you have uh, neck tensing, neck jerking, shoulder shrugging, torso twisting, abdominal tensing, and even legs you know, tend to be involved in kicking, toe scratching, and so on. Um, tics uh, are defined as a simple or complex, and motor tics are simple if they involve just one muscle, really. Complex uh, motor tics involve multiple muscle districts. So they look like uh, more complex, uh, semi purposeful actions. The same distinction applies to vocal tics, uh, but here, simple vocal or phonic tics uh, are just utterances or vocalizations, whereas complex vocal tics are entire words. So the distinction here is semantics. There's a meaning. Uh, attached to complex vocal tics. And uh, as I already said, uh, the most common uh, vocal tics are actually phonic tics, uh, grunting, throat clearing, coughing, uh, sniffing. Um, a few examples, you are all familiar with these, I blink and so on, but some of the, the most puzzling uh, sort of presentations I've seen, this is a case from Queen Square, and uh, it was um, a patient with a tic disorder, who had uh, aerophagia, so air swallowing uh, as a tick. And uh, she ended up with uh, distended bowels, cramps, uh, all documented on x-rays. 
Another uh, case, uh, this is a male uh, young adult who used to come to follow-up appointment uh, with uh, uh, his mother. She was desperate. She had to buy a new pair of shoes every couple of weeks because he had this asymmetric uh, kicking as part of his uh, motor uh, tics. And he was destroying the tip of the right shoe no, uh, for uh, every new pair. He ended up with a uh, uh, interphalangeal joint uh, damage because of that. So some of the ticks have a sort of a sinister physical consequences. Consider that they're present 24-7. And uh, I mean, the frequency varies uh, in individual patients, but also varies according to the environmental situations, as you know, uh, stress uh, and increases tick severity, but also um, it's not rare to see that children with Tick disorders get worse in December and they get excited for Christmas uh, holidays and so on. Um, a few other examples of self-injurious behaviors as a consequence of uh, these uh, uh, ticks uh, can be found in these uh, references. But um, what I want to stress uh, most, which is uh, like uh, the take home message, is um, this diagnostic clue. Uh, the most uh, important diagnostic question in the differential diagnosis of hyperkinetic movement disorders, when you suspect a tick disorder. It's about the sensory symptoms. Patients with ticks report characteristically, report a premonitory urge, physical tension, unpleasant, distressing sensation that builds up until they cannot hold it back anymore and they have to release the tick in order to find the relief from this sensation. There's even a scale that's been recommended by the European Society for the Study of Tourette Syndrome, the one that you see in my background, the eh, ESSTS. Um, the scale uh, has been recommended for the assessment uh, in uh, specialist uh, um, tick disorder clinics. It's called the Premonitory Urge for Tick Scale. It's very quick, 10 items, a patient report, and it's a catalog of these physical distressing sensations that drive ticks. Tension, pressure, wound up, just right, incompleteness, energy that needs to be released, and so on. They've even been mapped. So patients who have eye blinking as a tick might report that they feel the tension around the orbit area, okay? They report like feeling they have to hold uh, up a dumbbell with uh, their eyes. So when they blink, they get a relief and that. And uh, um, I tell you already that uh, tick disorders are still quite mysterious in terms of their pathophysiology. And that's partly due to the fact that uh, research is traditionally focused on the motor output, whereas we have now become more aware that uh, the initial sort of uh, um, process that uh, starts the tick cycle is a sensory phenomenon is premonitory urge. So that's where research is currently going. And they found that these sensory phenomena have brain correlates that don't necessarily overlap with the brain correlates of tick expression. So the brain correlates of the premonitory urge extend beyond motor areas of the brain. They include the anterior cingulate, the insula, so structures that are involved in self-monitoring and the affective consequences, the emotional tone associated with this self-monitoring. And this is the summary of uh, the, the state of the art. You see interoception, exteroception, the role of the insula and the sensory motor cortex, not just motor, basal ganglia and the motor cortex, but also sensory cortex. Uh, who develops ticks? Well, that's another uh, question mark, I'm afraid. Um, it's been known for a long time that uh, they tend to run in families, but it's equally well established that uh, uh, they don't follow a Mendelian transmission pattern, so no autosomal dominant or recessive. We talk about genetic heterogeneity. So there are multiple genes 
sitting in multiple chromosomes that if mutated or if present in a particular allelic variant, make the person, the child, vulnerable or more vulnerable to develop ticks at some point. So don't be surprised if in the family of your patient, you find that ticks have skipped the generations and they presented in different degrees of severity in uh, scattered members, as I said, not necessarily following uh, the offspring. And this is uh, uh, the European society, um, UK is still part of it, despite uh, uh, Brexit. <laughs> and uh, um, uh, I mean, most of you, I believe, are psychiatrists by training, so I'll uh, I want to say a few words about the psychiatric aspects or the non-motor aspects of Tourette syndrome. And as you can see, this is a common theme nowadays across most movement disorders, both neurodevelopmental and neurodegenerative. This attention that is shifted towards the non-motor aspects, I'd say uh, mainly driven by quality of life research. So they've seen that uh, um, there are patients who have relatively mild motor impairment, but their quality of life is severely affected. And these are the patients who struggle with the ADHD, as we've just heard, with the OCD, the tick-related OCD, affective symptoms, anxiety, and so on, okay? So that's not surprising because if you think again of the pathophysiology, I have mentioned already areas that do not necessarily belong exclusively to the motor control pathways. In particular, the basal ganglia are connected uh, through this uh, limbic loop with the limbic system. So you see that here, motion and emotion really share the same neural substrate within basal ganglia. And that substrate is mainly the striatum, eh? the ventral portion of the striatum, if you remember from the neuroanatomy, is also called the nucleus accumbens, or accumbens in Latin. And that is a sort of dopaminergic uh, 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 receptor rich area that's important for reward seeking behaviors. And that is part of basal ganglia, so part of the motor circuitries. So um, again, I refer you to a few recent papers on the psychiatric aspects of uh, Tourette syndrome, the European, uh, the neurologic, and the American one, CNS spectrum is here, uh, just uh, to remind you, uh, which are the psychiatric or behavioral symptoms to look for when assessing patients with tick disorders. And these are mainly obsessive compulsive behaviors of a particular kind, the so-called tick-related OCD. I put here a couple of examples. Arithmomania, obsessional counting, having to do things in threes, in fours, having to set the volume of, on a specific number because the patient feels physically uncomfortable unless that particular OCD just right ritual has been fulfilled, okay? So this, already this description should uh, remind you in a way of ticks. It's very much a tick-like you know, manifestation. And then ADHD, and uh, this has already been beautifully covered, uh, really. It's very common in children with ticks. It's about 60% of children with ticks fulfill current uh, diagnostic criteria for full-blown comorbid ADHD. So again, just a real life example, patient who comes to the Tourette syndrome clinic carrying a letter written by computer, my symptoms. And there's a bullet point list, ticks. So she is or he is in the appropriate clinic, apparently. And then the bullet points go on and you find compulsions and obsessions sensations, depression, anxiety slash panic attacks, mood swings, and even neurotic paranoia. And that's the rule rather than the exception. And the description went on and on and on. And only the first page was about the tics. All the rest was about these behavioral symptoms that affected 
quality of life to a larger extent than ticks. So again, don't be surprised if uh, when you read uh, influential review articles on Tourette syndrome written after the turn of the millennium by the world experts, you find that invariably Tourette syndrome is at the overlap of these symptom domains. Only one is ticks. Majority are behavioral domains. And that's uh, the current view of uh, Tourette syndrome spectrum uh, with uh, the Tourette syndrome plus Tourette plus OCD, ADHD, and so on, being the most common clinical presentation that we see in the NHS and uh, in, in all specialist clinics. Um, this is the same. This is for the GPs at the BMJ. And this uh, is also solid. Uh, uh, research evidence behind it. This is the largest uh, study ever conducted worldwide on patients with Tourette syndrome. 3,500 patients recruited in specialist clinics across the world, 22 countries. You see that only 10% of them had pure Tourette syndrome, Tourette syndrome only. 90% had at least one psychiatric comorbidity. And this was replicated in the general community in the Scandinavian registries. 90% of children diagnosed with Tourette syndrome in the community have at least one psychiatric condition, Tourette syndrome plus. Specialist clinics in the UK, this is the London clinic, uh, when we reviewed the uh, activity of uh, uh, 20 plus years, uh, six, uh, 650 patients, and you see again that 10% of pure Tourette syndrome has been replicated. So nine out of 10 have at least one psychiatric comorbidity. Let me just uh, spend a few words about uh, OCD, the tick-related OCD. I already told you something, but uh, since ADHD has already been covered, I thought I might share uh, some of uh, uh, these concepts uh, on tick-related OCD with you. So I mentioned the arrhythmomania, the counting, which are the other tick-related obsessive compulsive behaviors. Well, there's the concern for symmetry, having to even up things. There's the force touching, often combined. If I have to touch it with the left, I feel like also to touch it with the right, and so on. Then uh, uh, there are other uh, OCD symptoms, which you can also find in pure OCD, like checking behaviors. They are fairly common as a tick-related OCD. What you don't find in patients who have uh, also ticks uh, is uh, the washers, the cleaners, the contamination concern type of primary OCD. That's something that uh, is very rare in patients who have ticks. So again, this reveals a different underlying brain substrate. Tick-related OCD seems to be driven more by these dopaminergic frontostriatal basal ganglia pathways, dopaminergic. Whereas primary OCD, especially the subtype like uh, the cleaners, the washers, as you know, it's mainly a serotonergic type of uh, problem, no? limbic system and serotonin and so on, with uh, treatment implications. Uh, you can already imagine uh, pharmacotherapy changes. And this is the evidence that uh, uh, this is true. Both in children and in adults, it's been reported that tick-related OCD responds or can respond well to augmentation therapy with antidopaminergic drugs, especially aripiprazole and risperidone, something that you would use anyway for the ticks. So if you are aware of this, you can kill two birds with one stone in a way. Um, I go fast on these clinical aspects, uh, going towards the conclusion. 
um, quality of life. So um, since 2008, uh, the, the, the clinical scientific community has uh, had access to the first Tourette syndrome specific quality of life scale. It's a self-report instrument that again allows clinicians to assess in a standardized and validated way which domains of quality of life are affected in that particular patient with Tourette syndrome. And you see that out of the four domains, only one is strictly linked with the severity, the frequency, the intensity of the tics. The other three domains, psychological, obsessional, and cognitive, are more related to these cognitive and behavioral comorbidities. Okay, and uh, you, uh, you you can see that since uh, the uh, publication of the scale, the research on quality of life has, uh, has, uh, has started really. And now we have also the GTS Qual, so the scale version for children and for adolescents. And it's been validated in English language as well. It was first uh, developed in Italian and then validated in English. So that is something that guides you towards uh, priorities in treatment interventions. Which are these treatment interventions? And I'm um, <laughs> veering towards the conclusion here. Well, you see, uh, again, we have to distinguish uh, priority tics, uh, OCD, ADHD, which ASP. And then if we focus on the actual tics, behavioral treatment strategies, habit reversal training, exposure and response prevention, these are the main two, medication, not only antidopaminergic uh, drugs, but also other classes, including the alpha-2 agonists. Eh? We've just heard the ADHD lecture, no? Eh, so again, another way of sometimes uh, killing two birds with one stone, with the alpha-2 agonist, with the clonid in guanfasi. And finally, the invasive treatment interventions. Psychosurgery, if you want, eh? deep brain stimulation for the very severe refractory cases, still at pioneering stage. So let's start with the behavioral techniques. They try to break the vicious cycle, the tick cycle at the level of the urge, so that patients habituate to the urge without ticking. Easier said than done. There's some evidence from the North American group, Doug Woods and colleagues about the habit reversal training, other centers around the world have not replicated such good findings. According to their findings, there's a 50% chance of a good response with this technique. It works on one tick at a time only, and patients have to develop the so-called competing response that they produce in place of the actual tick that they want to fight. On the contrary, exposure and response prevention works on all ticks at the same time. And patients uh, are uh, trained to resist the urge for all of their ticks for progressively longer periods of time. It's a bit like having someone with uh, uh, fear of hates, uh, snakes, and fear in the dark uh, living uh, this situation. So it's, it's tough, really. Mm. Medications, again. There's no nice guidelines here, contrary to Parkinson's disease, just to remain within the realm of movement disorders. But if we look at the evidence of the available RCTs, we see that in the last decade, not more than that, in the last decade, there have been international guidelines that have been published. And I've put here the list so you can access them. Go for the most recent ones, which are the American ones, Neurology 2019, and the European ones, which are currently impressed in the ACAP journal, European Child Adolescent Psychiatry. This is what they look like. You can already access them. Medications, as we said. Well, I refer you to the book about it. It's, it's, it's an art, as you can see, plenty of choice. But here, the take home message is always, always consider the balance between 
efficacy and tolerability. Go back to Hippocrates. Primum non nocere, first do no harm. Because often these are medications that can uh, affect uh, functioning, can be sedating, they can have metabolic adverse effects, they can uh, cause weight gain, so they can affect health in other ways. And the main classes, again, I'll be very quick, um, I, well, I've grouped them into four main classes and I've followed the, the current uh, evidence. First generation antidopaminergic drugs, aloperidol, pimozide, no longer use the first or even second line because of tolerability, what I just said, pimozide including cardiotoxicity. Second generation antidopaminergic drug currently suggested, recommended, often as first line, especially the newest, aripiprazole, which is a partial agonist of dopamine receptor, seems to be the best tolerated. Alpha-2 agonist, third group, first line in a number of guidelines, including the Canadian guidelines. And finally, other drugs, uh, including uh, um, anti-epileptic drugs like uh, topiramate, for instance, that recently entered the guidelines. So this is our experience with uh, aripiprazole. And you see that tolerability is good. Very few patients discontinue it because of tolerability issues. This is a recent uh, review about aripiprazole. So I refer you to that if you're interested in the evidence about this first line medication for ticks. You see? adverse effects, sedation with gain, but not as much, not as severe, not as common as with the other antidopaminergic drugs. Even better tolerability profile with alpha-2 agonists, very well tolerated, safest, especially in children. And finally, the evidence for um, topiramate, the new kid on the block. Again, I refer you to uh, the, the, the behavioral <laughs> sort of uh, uses of anti-epileptic drugs on this. And this is what we do in, uh, in a real life uh, clinical experience. This is our own experience uh, recently. Uh, it's an audit basically recently published. Uh, it, it reflects uh, the current evidence that I just told you. And this is the head-to-head -head comparison in terms of efficacy and tolerability of aripiprazole with all its main competitors. And you see that it is uh, <laughs> well placed in, in this race, so to speak. My colleague Jeremy Stern from St. George's Hospital wrote in Practical Neurology that there is no single best first line drug. I can't agree more with that. So it's still very much an art and you require experience uh, to, to, to navigate uh, through this. Um, the other thing that I want to highlight is that uh, ticks are not necessarily the reason to start pharmacotherapy. In this beautiful study from the Danish group, Nanette Moldebes and colleagues, eh, it was uh, clearly shown that the reason for starting pharmacotherapy in uh, tick disorder clinic uh, is not uh, necessarily ticks. You see that uh, it's equally well represented ADHD and there are also other uh, behavioral problems that prompt pharmacotherapy. If you're interested in a real life case study on the usefulness of antidopaminergic drugs, especially aripiprazole and risperidone for tick related OCD, I refer you to this beautiful uh, uh, case study by the Canadians, Tamara Prinsine and colleagues. And uh, um, well, a number of patients will come to clinic eh, asking you about um, diet uh, and uh, vitamins and supplements uh, and so on. Well, there's a very little evidence. I'd say the only reliable evidence is to avoid energy drinks, sugar uh, uh, food, sugar rush. This is kind of fuel for the ticks. It's been well documented. Okay. And finally, I don't say anything about deep brain stimulation because it's still, I'd say, at the pioneering stage. These are the British guidelines, which we published 10 years ago. And I wouldn't say we haven't, we have moved uh, uh, forward uh, much in, in this field. So looking at the uh, clock, I think uh, uh, it's the end. 
I, I end with a quiz. I ask you, based on what I said, you think that any of these people had uh, Tourette syndrome? And they are Samuel Johnson, Dr. Johnson, and uh, Mozart. Well, with Mozart, there was a famous paper published in the BMJ claiming that Mozart did suffer from Tourette syndrome. That was based on the number of swear words that Mozart wrote in his letters. Is it evidence for Tourette syndrome? No. And in his biographers, there's no evidence of actual descriptions of tics. With Samuel Johnson, we are in the opposite situation. We are sure, confident, that he did suffer from both tics and tic-related OCD. Because in his biography by Boswell, the life of Samuel Johnson, there are countless uh, descriptions of uh, tics. And uh, I conclude with a, a positive note, uh, always uh, something we tend to forget, at least I tend to forget, uh, and I'm guilty of that. Don't forget uh, to stress the strengths that patients with Tourette syndrome have. They have a hyperactive brain, not deficit, hyperactive. And so if properly channeled, that could be a talent. And that was recognized by Oliver Sacks, who spoke about his creativity, his witticism of patients with Tourette syndrome. And this is an example of what I just told you. Look at this beautiful uh, uh, poem by a patient. I'm still seeing him, eh? he's now an adult. I mean, I first saw him in, at the age of nine. He's describing his Tourette. And finally, uh, of course, I am a fan of Samuel Johnson because uh, he was in turn a fan of uh, the Mediterranean. I stop here. If you have a, a burning question, there might be a minute or so. I thank uh, my mentors and my colleagues, and I thank you all for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Andrea, for this very interesting talk. We have a few questions, uh, but um, we don't have time for all. Uh, so I'll just select some which are, well, repeated. What doses of aripiprazole and clonidine do you use? And what's your first line drug for ADHD and tics? Yeah, I started with the last one, ADHD and tics, um, alpha to agonists, uh, as in terms of pharmacotherapy are recommended. And the other question, I didn't hear the first word. Was it which dose you start with? Yes. Yes, so aripiprazole 2.5 or 5 milligrams, the therapeutic range for adults is 20 to 30. Uh, well, 10, 10 to 20 is often enough. R rarely you have additional benefit if you go up to 30. With alpha-2 agonist, 25 micrograms. I increase it every couple of weeks in steps of 25. The target uh, is between 100, so 50 twice daily, up to uh, can be 100, 2 or 3 times a day, even, depending on body size. Thank you very much again, Andrea. And uh, now I will introduce our next speaker, our last speaker, last but, but by no means least, Dr. Jane McCarthy, who will give us a talk on psychiatric disorder and autistic adults. Dr. Jane McCarthy is an associate medical director and medical lead for learning disability service with the Sussex Partnership Foundation Trust. She is an honorary associate professor in psychological medicine in University of Auckland in New Zealand and a visiting senior lecturer in King's College. Over to you, Jane. Can you hear me? Yeah. Is this presentation coming up okay? Okay, so I'll start. I, I'm basically going to uh, have a very clinical presentation around presentation of psychiatric disorders in autism. And um, I'm a learning disability psychiatrist, and I think people thought I might focus on learning disabilities. So if you want to just go to the next slide, thank you. Yep. Can we go to the next slide? Great. Okay, yeah, I was going to focus, I'm going to focus on assessment, but I know that we probably had quite a lot already by, I unfortunately, Miss Tom's talk, but I did hear Digby's talk. And um, I know that uh, Professor Brugge has already told you about prevalence, but fundamentally, autism 
is a uh, lack of social instinct. So the basic tasks of going up and, and greeting someone, giving them facial expression, this is a this is a challenge for people with autism. This is pre-COVID emanation. And they're a very heterogeneous group of people with autism. So you might have people suspect Bill Gates to the very autistic child that's completely on the, uh, no communication and is uh, has no interest and just wants to focus on whatever the toy or interest is. So it's a very mixed group, which I'm sure Tom's already talked about. Next, next slide. Please, thanks. And um, I think it's still important to uh, emphasize what is the DSM-5 criteria for autism. It is a social deficits in communication interaction and that you have to have these second criteria of restricted interests and behaviors. And that if you just have the social impairment, then DSM-5 doesn't recognize you to have autism. So. Next slide, yeah. So the, I just wanted to focus on this because the fundamental challenge I have every day as a clinician, though I see people with learning disabilities, is unraveling what is the core symptoms of autism I'm seeing and what is actually an additional psychiatric disorder, which I need to be maybe do something about. And it's been really interesting hearing the previous presentation around tics and ADHD and how much time you might have to take to unravel quite complex cases but fundamentally what I've already said is that people with autism they have a problem with the non-verbal communication so you know the gestures the facial expression changing your facial expression having altering your tone of voice to get something across a message across people with autism not only cannot do that variation but they struggle to recognize it in others and they have problems recognizing feelings so they've can't, you know, if you ask them about sadness, describe happiness, fear, anger, they can say, oh, well, yes, I was, I was sad when the cat died. But if you actually say, can you describe what that inner, that motion is, they really struggle. So, you know, this is leading to the challenge of under, uh, undertaking psychiatric assessments. And the other thing is they can't read those motions very easily in others. Uh, so they might not know that they're making you frightened or angry. And they, as I think Digby Tanton has alluded to in, in the morning presentations, they have real problems, I mean, people used to call this theory of mind, of understanding, you, you all know that we're probably thinking slightly differently, uh, but a person with autism might not realise that you are completely on a different, I've got different thoughts and sets of uh, view in the world. And they really struggle to uh, predict other people's intentions as a result. And they really struggle to imagine situations outside their usual routine. So you might take them to the bank, go through that task, and they take them next door to the post office. This is a very concrete example. But they can't uh, generalise very easily when you teach them tasks. This is one of the challenges we have at the sort of building uh, life skills and social skills for them. OK, next slide. Yeah, I mean, I think we've already been through this, but uh, I've referenced Kathy Lloyd, who uh, people have alluded to, who led on the development of the Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule. Uh, she just produced a very good paper in Lancet Psychiatry, 64 pages long, which really, to be honest, summarises all the evidence around comorbidity in autism and also summarises the pharmacological and other interventions from the evidence base, and I've referenced it at the end. And the college uh, produced a document in 2014, which is all led by Tom Burney, on the prevalence of psychiatric disorder, which, as you guess, like all these neurodevelopmental conditions, the risk for psychiatric disorder is much greater. And if you look at clinic-based studies of people who turn up with autism, they have high rates of these and high function autism. It's quite an old study, but it sort of resonates with the previous presenter on people with uh, Tourette's or tic disorders. There's high, they don't just come with one thing. They come with a comorbid, usually comorbid forms of psychiatric disorder. Next slide, please. Yeah, I mean, the risk factors for psychiatric disorder, probably first degree relatives or people with autism are at risk for OCD, um, Tourette's tics, um, bipolar, mood disorders. At first, we, we thought that, you know, the parents of people with autism were depressed because of some of the difficulties of bringing a young person up with autism. So actually, if you meet uh, most of the mums I uh, meet with young adults with autism, a number are already on some form of antidepressant, but there is a genetic biological relationship. 
uh, did be tanked and talked about this loneliness they feel, that rejection, particularly through these teenage years. If anyone with autism has been to mainstream school, they've been bullied. They want the friendships, but they're awkward and difficult and get rejected by their peers. And people with autism aren't protected from childhood adversity or abnormal family environments or deprivation. It still impacts on them, even though they might seek process the world differently. And in fact, they're probably much more at risk of um, experiencing such uh, childhood adversities for a number of reasons. Next slide, please. Yeah, so I, I thought I'd just flag up this document, which Tom led on and a number of the people that presented today have been part of, uh, on the psychiatric, uh, psychiatric management of autism in adults. Next slide, please. Because it had a number of recommendations and I've listed three on this slide. And I thought um, people might have already read it and this is why they're here today. But it says all psychiatrists, so it's not just people like me working in learning disability services or neurodevelopmental services, need to, um, to continue to improve their expertise in autism through training and experience and familiarize themselves with the autistic world. And I'm not sure what they mean by, uh, I can get the, what training that's coming to today and learning about all the tools and resources available. The experience is that, you know, watching more episodes of uh, Doc Martin, showing my age, watching the film Rayman, or, you know, the book about uh, the curious into the dog in the night time but uh, it's definitely we do you know emphasize that that training and all psychiatry should be able to recognize and treat psychiatric disorders and distinguish it from the features of autism and I think that's the hardest thing to do because it's okay for me and, and uh, as my the colleague spoke about ADHD how many people he'd seen with ADHD over the years in clinics that's something you just have you can only build up over time there aren't too many shortcuts and that all psychiatric services should have a close working or uh, you know with your local specialist autism resources well you know what are the local autism resources how well resourced are they they usually have invariably on your development service and Sussex has a long waiting list partly because of this increase in ADHD referrals but also the increase in autism referrals as well uh, so it's an ongoing challenge of how, and it's interesting about the ADHD, how they're trying to improve the uh, filtering through of GP referrals to take the impact and pressure off the secondary care resources. Okay, next slide. Um, this slide, in, after this is my special interest looking at mental health service data, but I was looking at it for something else, um, to see how uh, they collect every month how many people are hospital spells related to autism or learning disability and uh, please challenge me if I've got my numbers wrong but I, and in any any month I might that calculation eight percent of mental health beds I think this is predominantly by people with autism rather than learning disabilities because people with learning disabilities usually get access to a specialist service those less of those around and it's interesting that uh, Professor Brugge a, a survey of in the Midlands showed that probably 10% of inpatient mental health beds are, are uh, occupied by people who are on the autistic spectrum. So, you know, I think the college is right. We probably have to build people's awareness and skills because there isn't a whole resource of specialist service out there that are going to necessarily see people with autism. Next slide, please. Yeah, so I've I've sort of alluded to the challenges of trying to assess uh, a mental health problem in someone with autism, and you know about the, describing their inner world and the symptoms of mental illness. But fundamentally, and it's you know it's very interesting to hear the previous presentation. Uh, people with autism have a different brain structure, and you know I've always sat there and wonder, you know, when I see ADHD. Is this the ADHD that I see in everyone else? Or is this a different ADHD that is uh, part of the, what people without uh, pre-existing, uh, something that's happened to their brain development? And despite all the research, we're still struggling to understand the fundamentals of the brain. Uh, the, the latest thinking is that there's something uh, in the how the integrity of the connection between brain cells might work. There's obviously the neurochemical issues around imbalance of GABA and glutamate, and certainly like GABA is uh, produced, the neurons are produced very early on before they move to the cortex. So something's gone really 
wrong in the early development of the brain to sort of give you this global picture affecting the individual. And as I said, most of this presentation is actually trying to drill down what is the core, you really have to understand what is the core features of the autism and the core features of autism for that individual. Next slide, please. Yeah, well, you know, the ideal world is, and I don't know what it's like day, day in, day out to be in a adult mental, well, I know it's very busy from where I uh, see it from when I work in uh, this part of Sussex, but um, yeah, ideally, um, you need to know the person when they're well. And this is why it's interesting that uh, it was raised in the ADHD presentation. You need an informant because as we've already alluded to, the person with autism might not be able to describe their inner world as, in, a, in a way that uh, describes what they're experiencing, but you, somebody that can come along and maybe give you some observational or uh, history or context of the individual. And yes, obtain the early health record. So if you are seeing somebody, I mean, whether you have time in most psychiatry clinics, to see if there's an early developmental history that suggests that the person is possibly got a neurodevelopmental or autistic problem but I thought it was interesting Professor Brugger talking about people that might not have developmental history but look like they are autistic in the late teenage early adult lives and yeah these complex cases require time and uh, time is maybe not the easiest thing to access in the under the pressures of the NHS and um, a psychiatric disorder may blind us to the fact that there's an underlying autistic disorder so we might see the ADHD we might see the depression, we might see the personality disorder, and we don't realize that what we're trying to do is that we're actually struggling to work with the individual because we haven't understand what the other core difficulties are. Next slide, please. Yes, yeah, so this is what uh, the college is getting at, really, the requirements of the clinician. And we've got to see autism, you've got to see autism in its various manifestations. And, that, you know, as I said, it's a spectrum condition and you can have highly functioning, highly achieving individuals, or you can have very disabled young people who I might see every day in my clinical practice. Uh, but I think whatever you do, and this is, you know, why the college has always emphasised this um, training in a developmental field of psychiatry whether it's child psychiatry, learning disability psychiatry. And until you have that sort of developmental perspective, then I think it's hard to really understand these uh, particular conditions and autism. Next slide, please. Yeah, these are some tips. Uh, I was interested in the tips people were give, uh, giving about how to get someone to uh, have open-ended questions and ask some uh, general questions about how they function on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, people with autism um, don't do well in the standard outpatient clinic where the lighting isn't very good. Uh, the next, you can hear the next, it's very noisy along the corridor. And if you take, if you, um, you know, have a long meeting with them, I don't think I would put a person, I know they do this with the autism diagnostic assessments, but, you know, put them through long interviews. And I think to get the best out of them, you do have to have a quite calming environment without too much sensory overload in it. And yeah, use straightforward, simple language. Well, you know, it's easy said than done. I don't say that I use a lot of visual cues, but they are available to me. Yeah, and uh, people with autism take things very literally. So, you know, if they knock on the office door and say, can they speak to you? And I say, oh, please uh, wait five, please give me five minutes, I'll come out. That means I'll probably come out in the next half an hour. But to a person with autism, they'll probably stand outside the door and count you down for the next five minutes. So, you know, simple things that you take for granted might uh, and you think, no, you know, the meaning behind a person with autism struggles with the meaning behind what you're saying and will take it at a very literal level. OK, next slide. So the comprehensive assessment, well, you know, I was looking at the Q&A, um, you know, I'm going to get through this so you know, it's not a long uh, we we'll get to the afternoon, end of the day. But I was looking at the Q and, R, Q and answer the questions that they, people are taking two hours to make an ADHD, uh, ADHD assessment. Yeah, it would be great if you can do all a very good comprehensive assessment of someone with autism. And this is what the autism diagnostic services 
would hopefully do for you. But I don't know what you do in the reality of seeing people with autism. Maybe if they're on your inpatient unit, you might have time or be able to import somebody to do it. But in the in a busy mental health clinic, I'm not sure. But this is the ideal, and you know maybe this is what we should be striving for. And Dibby said that certainly in forensic, and when I worked in forensic autism service, the first thing we did, well, the first thing we did before we admitted anyone was make sure they did have autism, because there's no point coming to a special service if you don't have autism. But the point about the diagnosis I've always found, if I read through the diagnostic, whether it's an autism diagnostic interview or the ADOS, it sort of really uh, gives me insight and understanding to where that particular individual's difficulties lie and understanding their sensory and interest issues. There's no, there's no test I can say this will help you um, diagnose autism. I know Professor Declan Murphy did some neuroimaging work years ago around that, but basically autism is a clinical diagnosis and you just have to develop the skills. And uh, Professor Brugger uh, flagged you up about the tool that the Royal College of Psychiatrists has developed and, you know, the, uh, all, the Psychiatric Management of Adults with Autism uh, College report has got an appendix listing all the sort of screening tools and diagnostic tools. But as um, Terry Brugger alluded, screen tools aren't that useful in this population. And if you have no previous diagnostic autism training, then you either go to this Royal College tool, and, and, and which you can get on the, on the website. I don't know if Tom's still doing the training days on it. But the other one I would say is go to the autism diagnostic observation schedule training, because basically it just sort of makes you eat, drink and sleep diagnosing autism, but it really builds up your basic observation skills. Moving on to the next slide. Yeah, so if you haven't got all the time in the world, maybe there's some clues of the person sitting in front of you. And as Terry uh, Brugger said, you know, I, we've all missed people over the years. You know, my skill in recognising autism has really, uh, hopefully has got a lot better over, over the years. But I, looking back, I realised there's people I saw with very severe OCD and other types of condition. I realised I completely missed it. But yeah, you know, the eye contact, the facial expression, the tone of voice, they're very, they stay on one topic. And also the, the social interaction with you, it doesn't feel like this is something that um, you usually see that, uh, in the patients you see. I think, you know, if you, I've sat in a room with somebody and uh, after an hour, all I've learned is 20 uh, ways to cook a chicken and I've learned very little else and then on reflection the light bulb switches on and I realise maybe I'm just uh, that person's on the autistic spectrum. Okay so next slide. Yeah so I thought I'd just go through some key psychiatric disorders that we see. Uh, yeah depression I would say depression is much more common in this group um, but as you'd say you if you've never met the person before and they are got a number of core autistic symptoms how do you know that what you're seeing in front of you is something that's changed that is depression this is what we commonly see because in the learning disability service because people have chronic behavioral presentations and how do we unravel whether something's changed and we're actually seeing a psychiatric disorder and i think you know uh increase at any change in significant change in behavior any worsening of autistic symptoms and any increase withdrawn isolation will flag you up that maybe you are seeing some sort of depressive disorder but i keep coming back that you you know you need to know the person when the well and ask an informant you know i say well if i met them a year ago how would they have presented differently as they are today and what we you know what were the core autistic symptoms then and what am i seeing now Next slide. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the whole business about schizophrenia and autism was unraveled in the 1970s by Izzy Colvin, but um, people with autism do get uh, psychotic presentations. I think they're more prone to these brief episodes than the full blown schizophrenia. And my experience is that usually related to transitioning into adult life or other significant stressful events. But my experience is that if I do see some sort of psychotic symptoms of someone with autism, I think mood disorder before I think of a schizophren uh, schizophrenia spectrum disorder. OK, next slide. Yeah. As I've said, there's this family history. I don't know what it all unravels to and down to because I'm not a geneticist. But there are other risk factors that uh, people with autism and schizophrenia share in terms of 
older parents and something going wrong at birth but you know is there something going wrong at birth because the child is all the baby's already on an abnormal brain projection directory and that's what it's about there's this association with childhood schizophrenia which 30 percent have an autism spectrum disorder well this is judith rapaport's work but i you know is this childhood schizophrenia something different to what we see in later uh young adult life and yeah autism is a risk factor for bipolar and as i said you really have to sometimes unravel is this sort of a clear change of mood irritability increased aggression uh overactivity complete disturbance of sleep uh and now you're seeing a much more a sort of hyper manic episode next slide please yeah so it you know i sort of alluded to what the mental state examination and um I think it's easy for us in learning disability field where we see people with autism every day in our clinical practice. But you know, what what are what how do you um see people with schizophrenia? Because the negative symptoms may very much look like the uh core symptoms of someone's autism. And people with autism, you know, they can misinterpret, not understand the world, as I've said before. Um, is this some sort of unusual rigidly held belief? You know, do they really understand their inner world, their inner thoughts? Are they being misinterpreted to say they're hearing voices? So I think you really need to be clear about whether you're seeing a psychotic illness or some worsening of their autistic symptoms under stress or anxiety. And it's a brief psychotic episode. And I think years ago, we would pick up people who have been given this diagnosis of schizophrenia with autism. And then when you went back to their records, there's no real clear uh symptoms of um delusions and hallucinations and so you you really then review what is the medication yeah thank you for going on to the next slide yeah and dsm-5 is quite clear about this that um you can really only make the diagnosis of schizophrenia in someone with autism if they have got quite prominent delusions and hallucinations for at least a month and uh, there's a recent paper i read from america that backs this up but sometimes it can be quite gray and we, you know, you get into this pragmatic trial of uh, antipsychotic medication, which I'll uh, come to later about the use of medication. But we we'll just have the next slide. Yeah, I mean, this is quite a simple case history I've given here, but it sort of um, gets to this business about uh, these things normally come on late teenage years, early adult life. It, uh, Mark has got autism. And he's already got the difficulty understanding social cues, social relationships. And the girl, this is a girl in the class who quite, you know, helpful and friendly, but uh, he interprets that, that that must mean she wants a relationship with him. She wants to be his, uh, she wants to be his girlfriend. And he comes quite fixated on it. It comes quite unshakable, quite rigid in his thinking about it. He completely, this is his, you know, he restricts his interest to the Facebook page. Okay, we put him on some antipsychotics because and it gets it gets better but is this really a brief psychotic episode or is his this is stress and anxiety in any way we've given him a small dose of risperidone so we've made him a little bit better and the problem is this is that you know as we say we sometimes we then have to revisit and whether the, the medication is justified in the long term and then the next slide please so Hannah, you know, she's, this is, you know, the common scenario of the more high functioning person with autism, though she's got, I'll put her down to have borderline because he's learning to be more patient group I see. Uh, she comes, she moves to college, a residential college, becomes very anxious and talks of voices. Uh, we put on a low dose antipsychotic as well. Yeah, is this an early brief psychotic episode under stress? And then uh, she does go back to college, but her ideas come much more, in a way, more delusional, much more about people interfering with her, her functioning starts to deteriorate. Uh, she's much more fearful. Are we seeing this, this is a path more towards a schizophrenia type illness? And sometimes, you know, it's complex, takes time, and you have to see the person over a period of time before you're sure. And I'm sure this is probably true of most of the uh, early intervention psychosis work. OK, next slide, please. Yes, as I said, coming back, because we obviously do pick people who have been uh, gone through the early intervention psychosis service, then they come to us in adult life. And, you know, we have to really go back and unravel what were the symptoms at the time. 
to then start to think, do we need to keep the medication? Yeah, I mean, anxiety, I think everybody with autism has got anxiety disorder. I mean, if, you, if your life is driven where you can't quite understand the world, your people are changing your routines around you, um, then yeah, I think you would be anxious. And probably the majority of people we have uh, who come to a clinic type learning disability service with behavioral anxiety problems, we probably put on an SSRI, but uh, is that justified? I don't know. There is, uh, I'll mention some research later. But yeah, when when do we, how proactive, do we see this as a core symptom of autism that we need to manage the sensory, we need to be consistent in the environment, we need to support them through what makes them anxious? Next slide, please. I think uh, it's interesting to hear, the, as I keep saying, the previous presentation, but you know, just in comorbidity with autism, uh, but when people have looked at this in um, OCD clinics, and nearly a third would meet the criteria for autism. Uh, probably compulsions are more common, obviously it's increased risk in relatives, but to get the thoughts, the obsessional thoughts is actually quite a challenge, or maybe more in the population I see. Next slide, please. Uh, people have tried to unravel this but what is you know the OCD and what is the autism and is the OCD slightly and it's a bit like the presentation on Tourette's and ticks um yeah, I think the OCD group you know if I see somebody with o autism and OCD well I think it's OCD I've got a very challenging young man 18 who stays in bed all day and he was passed, passed to me from National Children's Service to say he's got OCD, but we need to get him to hospital. Um, and he, he won't get, he gets out of bed, he completely freezes. He has to touch everything before he moves to the next, out the room. When he gets to a, a barrier, uh, to the moving out the room into the hallway, he doesn't, he gets, he just freezes again. Uh, someone knows what, I, what I'm diagnostically seeing, that'd be great. But, you know, I'm not going to get, he's got learning disabilities, so I'm not going to get into his uh, obsessional thoughts. And I think if it's his true OCD, it's about aggression and contamination. And to be honest, uh, the ASD group, ordering, repeating and touching behaviours are pro probably in a way part of their core symptoms. But if they are spending, you know, I have seen true OCD in people with autism, and if they're spending two hours in the bathroom cleaning and they're multiply checking things, then I think I'm seeing a, uh, what I would call OCD rather than some severe form of the core autistic symptoms. Next slide, please. Yep, there's loads of other disorders that you can get in. I did have dementia on that slide and I took it off actually because I don't really know about dementia and autism, but um, in the learning disability, non-downed learning disability population, there's an indication because of the pre-existing brain abnormalities that uh, people are more like, at risk of um, uh, dementia. But to be honest, the reality is I've never seen it because they're uh, they don't smoke, so they don't tend to get the vascular risks, not particularly the moderate to severe people. Um, yeah, trauma and stress disorders and eating disorders, you know, the person with autism, is that an eating disorder? They, you know, they'll only ever eat anything that's green. Is that an eating disorder? Is that just part of the core symptoms of autism? A catatonia is a quite a challenging one um, to uh, Lorna Wing and Amita Shah said one in six adolescents that came to the specialist national centre had catatonia, but the reality is I've only ever seen it in people with autism with severe depression, but it sort of, uh, that merges onto that more neurological, neurology type presentations that you, uh, people who are much more attuned to this, who see those conditions probably more aware of. Okay, next slide. Yeah, substance and alcohol misuse, it's um, probably, there's very little, there's not a great literature on it, it's more on alcohol use, and obviously I worked in forensic autism services, and it probably was a risk factor for the ones that suddenly came, uh, would came in with um, uh, showing severe, viol uh, usually a violent episode, they were probably, uh, had a uh, uh, poor interaction or didn't understand what the peer or the relationship around them was about and they picked up a knife or did whatever it's usually used for self-medication when we looked at uh, people with neurodevelopmental disorders in prison the um, autistic prisoners didn't use alcohol or substances any more than other prisoners but when the ones that did have autism that were using substance, nearly over 90% had ADHD. So it was the comorbidity that was driving that substance issues rather than the autism. Next slide, please. 
Yeah, um, as I think Professor Rue said, there's not a lot on suicide and self-harm behavior, but it is growing. Uh, and it's clearly that it is linked to comorbidity with other mental illness. So it's really important that you do see people with autism have comorbid psychiatric disorders, that they are particularly risk. And you know this business about, well, they don't really express their emotions and thoughts, so it makes assessment very difficult. And people with autism learn scripts to, you know, delivered to you in various scenarios so they might say oh I'm feeling suicidal and then you ask them well what does that mean you know you have to sort of drill down to get the meaning because they're maybe just saying words with which they don't actually even know the meaning of themselves um, and you know and ask quite concrete questions when do you get the thoughts how do you respond and uh, bullying is probably quite a risk factor for it um, apparently the evidence shows that being female well yeah but the presence of ADHD in this group and 30% um, of people with autism probably have ADHD, if not higher. Yeah, 30% of uh, people with intellectual disability have autism. I mean, all these conditions, and I'm sure Tom alluded to this this morning, are uh, overlap considerably. But um, they are a risky group. I just thought, I think it was talked about this morning, but um, women with autism, because this is usually the, the, where they ring me up though I'm a learning disability psychiatrist to come and see a woman in a um, usually on a medical ward or another ward who's presenting in quite a challenging way it's usually the women but we'll come I'll come back to that in the next slide but basically it's interesting this about the diagnosis of autism in women as I said uh, boys more than girls but obviously that's less so in the more uh, learning disability population but Mike Craig this, did this work years ago at the Institute of Psychiatry and didn't find any difference in the brain abnormalities and earlier work doesn't suggest that there are particular differences in the autistic symptoms and it's one it's this camouflage in which I think people have alluded to already that women probably because they're with other girls at teenage years, sort of pick up skills about eye contact and learning scripts from the other girls they mix with and or other women if they get older and that they can camouflage. The problem about this camouflage, and I think is what uh, Digby Tantum alluded to, it's actually quite stressful. It's quite worrying and it probably doesn't help the well-being of the individual to camouflage to fit into society but that will mandy's work from ucl really worth having a read of very interesting okay next slide yeah so this is the group that they uh because um if anyone looks like they've got a borderline personality or with learning disability autism they want us to take over but you know it's very challenging we're only nine to five clinic services but anyway this is uh, quite old research but it, it's this again that um Significant number of people with borderline personality, 15%. It sort of fits in with uh, Professor Brugger's work. Temp he was saying that 10% uh, of, was it 1 in 20 or in clinics and 10% on wards. Um, so they looked at the ASD group and really there wasn't any difference in comorbid psychiatric disorders that the non-autistic group, as you expect, were more substance misusers. Uh, the ASD group did do more frequent suicide attempts. Uh, whether they completed, I don't know, but there were more attempts and they had much more negative self images. And I think this issue about, I uh, said at the beginning, is that people with autism can be at risk of uh, trauma and early life experiences because they don't realise people, uh, people are trying to abuse them, exploit them. OK, I'm conscious of time. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. Because basically they share similar difficulties of impulse and personalities, but obviously the borderline group know how to socialise and knows the social cues, but just distort them. Whereas people with autism don't really get the social cues. So it's quite a di difficult one to unravel. Coming Next slide. Yeah, this is just uh, thrown in for my uh, ID colleagues, because uh, we looked at this about 10 years ago in uh, when it was at South London Maudsley, you know, large clinic population of nearly what, seven, eight hundred people coming to the specialist mental health ID clinics and that um, people coming with, you know, having significant challenging behaviours in the context of autism. This wasn't, there wasn't, we didn't find that this was very much linked to psychiatric disorders, but there's a more recent paper in it from a Spanish uh, group in Spain 
who indicates that, and I think it's a non-clinic population where there wasn't previous diagnosis of mental disorders, obviously in the specialist clinics at the malls, they, they, with an ID psychiatrist, they're able to diagnose the psychiatric disorders, but they suggest that challenge behavior might, in undiagnosed um, uh, non-clinic populations, might you need to consider an underlying depression. Next slide, please. Yeah, so coming up to, I'm just going to give you a load of reference now. Please go, and, this is a um, nice guidance, of course, but Oliver Howe's paper from the British Association of Psychopharmacology is great guidance on uh, assessment treatment of uh, the core symptoms and the comorbid symptoms. So next slide. Yeah, and uh, Digby Tantum's done this work before and uh, said, and nice is about, there's no, there's no treatment for the core symptoms or autism. It's, uh, life skills, coaching, whatever, mindfulness, uh, and I've given you a systematic review reference there if you want to look about more broader mental health interventions. And next slide, please. Yeah, we do use medications for the associated symptoms, but we have STOMP, which is to stop the prescribing medications in autism and learning disabilities. And yes, of course, the main drugs we use are risperidone and aripiprazole in low doses and uh, melatonin for the sleep problems. There's no real evidence that the repetitive behaviors of the core symptoms orders respond to any of the drugs we have. That there's some small evidence for fluoxetine. Next slide, please. Yep, so you're nearly at the end of the day here. Uh, so basically with people with autism, they get a variety of mental health problems. Uh, the autism may mimic the psychiatric disorders you always get more than one condition and adolescence is a high risk time to adult services and the number of referrals we're getting through now of 18 year olds who probably have not quite had the service and resources in the last couple of years coming into our adult learning disabilities at waters and with quite challenging behavior this feels quite overwhelming at times um the next slide please yep oh no can you just go back one? Oh well you can yeah so uh, basically the college is saying that we, you, you all psychiatrists need to get better at this. Uh, does, that, does that mean we develop more enhanced community mental health services? I've sort of advocated that one or two, the inpatient ward should be very autistic friendly. The specialist autism teams can't do everything. Uh, okay, if they're very complex, comorbid maybe. Yes, we do need more research. There is a study going on at the moment on uh, looking at sertraline double blind controlled trial left, led by G. Giraj at the University of Bristol, which hopefully reports in 2023 on the impact of sertraline on anxiety in people with autism. And then next slide. Yeah, so these are just the references. Um, there's a uh, Terry Brewer already, Kathy Lloyd paper, autism spectrum disorder, really good paper. The Lancet Commission gives you all the evidence. Yeah, we, uh, oh, I forgot, I did have no conflict of interest, but I did edit a book with some colleagues from South London, but written by clinicians, the clinician side to mental health conditions. I get no uh, royalties from it, so they are. And we did write a chapter 10 years ago, but basically go back to the work of Terry Brueger from today around SCAN and assessing comorbid psychopathology. That will be your my answer to that one. And yep, last slide, um, any questions and I've finished. So thank you very much for your patience. Thank you very much, Jane, for the interesting talk. Um, I, yeah, I have a few questions actually, but many of which you answered along the way as the slides continued. Um, yeah, and thank you for citing references along as well. I actually have a question of my own. Um, I know, well, where, well, you mentioned Tom and well, uh, stop prescribing. Um, what's your views on long-term use of benzodiazepines to manage chronic anxiety and aggression in patients with autism, especially when, uh, where uh, antipsychotics have proven intolerable for these patients? Well, I'm I'm the older generation psychiatrist, um, so I don't have I'm not um, I, I I did my BAP training with Professor David Nutt, so I'm I'm not I'm less anxious about uh, benzodiazepines, um, and you know obviously uh, if polypharmacy is ripe in uh, uh, in autism and people with learning disabilities, and benzodiazepines are probably one of the safer drugs. So if all else fails, I'll say yes. But if you ask some of my younger colleagues, they'll probably think I'm out of order. The evidence 
I've been, I've just looked at the last 10 years of evidence of psychopharmacology and particularly the autism ID group. There's not really anything to guide you out there. Uh, but obviously the house paper on the broader use of uh, drugs and autism doesn't re really advocate the use of benzodiazepines. But, you know, I'm not saying no, the evidence isn't out there, but pragmatically, yeah, I don't, um, we don't exclude them. We do have probably a significant number of people on benzodiazepines because of the side effects of the other drugs. Thank you very much. And on this note, um, I think yeah, we are coming to the end of our uh, rich day. I would like to thank everybody here. I would like to thank um, uh, the, the delegates, the speakers. Um, I would like to thank Karen Morgan and Chesney Monroe. I'd like to thank Rafi Faruqi. And um, please um, take some time to uh, fill up the complete the feedback that's going to be sent to you and the link will be provided as well. Um, and uh, we, we all look forward to seeing you on our face-to-face -face, uh, conference um, coming um, at Briscoe Street in London. And so now we'll be closing the event. Please stay well and stay safe.